Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to All Space Considered at Griffith Observatory. How many of you have never been to All Space Considered before? Wow, what a big group. And how many of you are here for the second or more time? Okay, you know, it always looks like there are more. Somebody's got to be raising their hand twice. I'm quite certain of it. Um, but anyway, uh, we're so glad you're here, whether it's your first time, whether it's your 99th time. I don't know if we've done 99 shows. Um, probably feels like it, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. uh, so let me just give you a little introduction. I'm Dr. Laura Danley. I'm the curator of Griffith Observatory and your host for this evening, along with David Ro Dr. David Reitzel, who's our astronomical lecturer, and Patrick So, who's our planetarium and theater programs director. And we're your usual All Space Considered Correspondents. And as the title kind of suggests, we're a news and, and, uh, and discovery show to tell you all about some of the latest and greatest discoveries of the last month and look forward to some of the things that are coming up soon. So um, in case you're wondering, I'm just going to start by saying thank you whoever sent me this. <laughs> uh, last month I did a show about the cosmic microwave background radiation and I showed a picture of a plushie and I, I think I mentioned something or murmured something about, gee, I sure would love one of those plushies and not much longer it appeared in the mail, but there was no note. So uh, it could be anyone here. You can all take credit. Thank you all of you for sending me <laughs> this lovely plushie of the cosmic microwave, microwave background radiation. So I will just leave that there to, because we all come from this. This is us. This is our baby picture, uh, about 13.4 uh, uh, billion years ago. Um, Okay, so thank you for that. Those are the important introductory uh, things to say. Um, this is All Space Considered. A couple of uh, sort of, uh, you know, housekeeping things. If you have to leave, go out the back the way you came in. That takes you to a closet, and then you have to come back, and it's very embarrassing. That takes you to an emergency exit, but there are many, many choices of doors, and you will get very lost in the maze. So were there to be an emergency, we would direct you out. Uh, but we recommend that if you want to make it out on your own alive that you go out the back uh, and that, that's probably the smart thing to do. Um, and uh, you can leave your cell phones on but there is no reception in here so you will just be wasting battery as it roams looking for reception because we're all surrounded by this lovely what's referred to as a Faraday cage, this big metal uh, grate all around us and no radio or signals can come in here. So. You might have an alarm on or something, and that could go off, but you, aren't, you, might, you might as well just turn off your phone. Um, OK, and I think with that, I will introduce Bill. I'm assuming Bill's here. There you go, Bill. Tell us, uh, tell us about the music that people heard coming in. Yes, there's a music game that uh, all of you who are regulars already know about. Uh, you heard music cuts uh, as you were uh, <clears throat> playing as you were coming in. We call that our walk-in music. And all of those uh, pieces of music, each one of them, is uh, uh, connected in some way or another thematically or some other way to one of the stories that we're doing tonight. And if during the course of the night you see that story come up and you remember a piece of music, go ahead and shout the name out. And if you're the first person to shout out the correct uh, piece of music for the story, you get a prize. And there are all sorts of prizes down here that I will go over very quickly now. Um, I will give to every single winner something left over from our great Chandra uh, uh, talk last month. Um, about uh, how you can uh, speak in binary code to satellites. I'm sure everybody here would like one of those. Um, and we have uh, pins and uh, pins and pens that commemorate the, uh, was it the 20th anniversary, was it, of, of Chandra? Chandra? Yeah. And then uh, finally, of course, and also uh, stickers, we also have beautiful, beautiful calendars. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> you know, all know what I'm going to say. The calendars have one thing in common. They are all absolutely, almost completely out of date. Uh, we have a beautiful... <laughs> set of Mars rover calendars with incredible uh, uh, pictures inside, images and things. One, uh, it's a two year by the way, it's 2013 and 2014. Now 2013 calendars again were good again this year, but it's December, so you're probably not going to want to use it for that. So you will have to wait till, let's see, 2019. 2030 for the 2013 calendar to be correct. 2014, of course, though, is, um, is coming up 2025, so it, it'll be useful very soon. You just take one of these things, you stick it in your drawer. If you want to know what year it'll be good again, I've got the list right here, and I can share that with you. Now, 
They are beautiful calendars. I'm very serious about this. So I also want to say that the, the shouting out, you're, you're, you are invited to shout out the name of the song. Don't be shy. But during, we do have a, a guest speaker tonight. During the guest speakers, we don't play the game. No shouting out during the guest speakers. And Maybe um, you don't play the game. <laughs> <laughs> All right. OK. Um, well, anyway, so uh, that's about it. Please enjoy the show. Thank you. Okay, so on with the show. First of all, here is how you can follow All Space Considered at Griffith Observatory. Um, you can see GriffithObservatory.org is our, our um, website, but we also have our own sort of separate news feed of social media, so uh, consider following us on one of those. And then lastly, how many of you are members of Friends of the Observatory? I love seeing that number go up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Friends of the Observatory is our sister, 501c3, uh, uh, you know, charitable uh, donation um, support organization. So you can help Griffith Observatory and all the wonderful things that we do for fifth grade students and so forth uh, by joining Friends of the Observatory, and we can uh, urge you to do that. We also like to thank all you taxpaying citizens of Los Angeles because uh, Griffith Observatory is owned and operated by the city of Los Angeles. You may not know that. This is a city institution, a city park, and tax dollars support it. And they put food on my table, so I'm grateful to you for that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we're all City of Los Angeles employees, and uh, we thank all of those who support our efforts here. All right, let's get to tonight. It's the first Friday of every month, is all space considered, except that's not going to be true actually next month, so we probably should have hidden that one. Um, but anyway, uh, Friday, December 6th, and uh, we have a couple of stories from inside the solar system. Some wonderful new uh, results from the planets uh, that are most likely to possibly uh, have life on them. My favorite title was the spotty sporadic spout spotted on Spuropa. Um, and I got to thank Bill for that one because he went into an alliteration frenzy last week and we just, uh, that's how that all came up. But I especially like Spuropa. That's actually Europa. We'll tell you more about it. More on Titan, more on Mars. Uh, we have a lovely guest tonight who's going to talk about ghostly galaxies, and that's kind of nice as we go into the ghostly spirit of Father Christmas or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> it's trying to make it work. Um, whatever. And, uh, and then, of course, your sky reports. You can look up in the sky through the holidays, know what uh, you're looking at, pretty pics, and then break. And in the second half, we have a couple more stories, a um, little bit about some earth things, so hydrating, rehydrating California after some of our drought period. I'm sure everyone here has personal experience with that. Um, oh, you can sort of see it there, just lots of fun things. Virgin Galactic Planetary, Planetary Virgin Galactic. I'm really <laughs> looking forward to knowing what that one's all about. And then an in memoriam at the end of the evening. All right. Parker Planetary. Uh, that will be mentioned a little bit later. Yes. Uh, so let's start with some of the potentially habitable worlds in our solar system. Uh, you're looking here at Europa and uh, Titan and Mars. Mars on the right. Titan is a moon of Saturn. Europa is a moon of Jupiter. All three of them have had or have conditions that could mean that they're uh, ripe for life. So um, a, there is a fourth moon in our solar system. Look at that, Enceladus. Maybe you didn't realize, little tiny Enceladus. Uh, that might also be ha uh, habitable, but we're going to focus on these three tonight. So, um, David, why don't you tell us what's new, the latest, from Mars? Yeah, well, of course, we've sent rovers to Mars before. This is the Curiosity rover that's in Gale Crater. And Curiosity's been using the SAM instrument, the inlets on it, to measure the atmospheric content of Gale Crater. Recently, it's seen oxygen levels of... Yes. Yes. Where, where'd that come from? Yay! You won a prize. Wonderful. Prize. Um, so but the oxygen levels have, above, have been above the predictive levels, as you can see there in sort of that yellow uh, ellipsed area. Also, note that there's seasonal changes. It goes up with the seasons and then comes back down. So that's interesting. That has to be explained. Um, the Martian atmosphere is primarily carbon dioxide, 95%. has a little bit of nitrogen, argon. Oxygen only makes up 0.16%, so very little. Um, carbon monoxide, even less than 
methane makes up a 0.000 whatever that is with a 4 at the end, an incredibly small portion of the atmosphere. We'll talk about why that is and how it's important. Now, methane um, was detected on Mars in 2004 by Mars Express, and that was interesting because methane doesn't hang around very long in the atmosphere, so something has to be producing it for it to be seen. 2011, it was uh, ground-based spectroscopy, saw some upper limits for the methane on Mars. Curiosity landed, saw none at first. Everybody thought, wow, that's really weird. What, are the ground-based observations wrong? What's going on here? Well, finally, Curiosity did detect a spike of methane in 2014. 2018, the, uh, you know, again, um, it's, it was seasonal and cyclical, and then in 2019 detected the largest spike yet of methane. And now we're seeing oxygen showing up. You can see in this lower plot, by the way, the, the oxygen is the solid circles, the uh, methane is the squares, the lighter squares, and they track fairly well together. So do they have a similar source? Are they coming from the same place? The upper plot, by the way, the blue triangles and the pink circles, those are nitrogen and argon, and those are following the predicted levels. So this isn't something that all the gases are going up and down and maybe a problem with the instrument or something. No, some of the gases are behaving just as we thought they should, and the methane and oxygen are coming and going in, in amounts they shouldn't be. And as like I said, they're seasonal, and now I've added, well, I've, I'm showing you a plot that the methane has been added on top of the oxygen, and you again can see they all trace seasonably up and down, which is Interesting, that has to be explained. Here's the plot that NASA puts out, rather complicated for what can be causing it. Um, turns out that it can be perhaps soil. Um, it might be just reactions in the atmosphere. It could be reactions with the rocks. Um, turns out with the methane, the rocks have been somewhat ruled out. The wind erosion of the rock is not happening fast enough to release enough methane that they're seeing. But let's think about the oxygen for a minute. What could be doing that? Um, aliens maybe for the methane, for the oxygen? No? Well, maybe. That's, that's an idea. Little microbial bugs way down in there, possibly. Soil, though. Could it just be the soil and not the exciting idea of microbes? Probably not. It would literally take millions of years to get enough oxygen out of the soil to see these oxygen levels going up and down. Um, the atmosphere itself, if you break down carbon dioxide or you break down water molecules, you can produce um, O2. However, take five times more water in the atmosphere than there is, and the CO2 just breaks up too slowly. So you can't create those levels that we're seeing. Um, rocks? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> we haven't ruled that out yet. It might be rocks for the oxygen. Like I said, the methane rocks have been somewhat ruled out by one study, but, but rocks could definitely be it. Now, where could we learn about this to see what else it could be? Of course, we have Earth as a great example um, to study, and we've studied in depth. Earth, of course, has methanogens and um, photosynthetic bacteria that evolved three and a half billion years ago or so. So if we take a look at the content of Earth's atmosphere back then, primarily carbon dioxide, then the methane come, kicks in. So uh, it, it has to be produced somehow. It's being produced there by this methanogen bacteria. And it's same with the oxygen. By the way, when the oxygen showed up, that was called the Great Oxidation Event, and it killed off the bacteria that couldn't live in an ox oxygen environment. And that's why the methane dies out there, the methanogens died. But Mars was wet three and a half billion years ago, three and a half, two and a half billion years ago. That's right in those times where you have the methanogens and you have the oxygen producing ones, the photosynthetic. Maybe that's what Mars was like, and then the water froze, retreated underground, or simply left the planet as it lost its atmosphere. So could we be seeing signs with this methane and oxygen levels going up and down of maybe those Martian bacteria that went underground? Maybe there could be a layer where there is still liquid water and still enough warmth that we could have colonies of microorganisms in, in Mars. I think it's an exciting possibility. So it's, you know, it, it, it's suggestive, it's n my, by no means conclusive, mm -hmm. and I think, well, many, but especially Carl Sagan is known for saying extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So you can rule out all these other things. It's kind of at some point, though, we need mm -hmm. to get the right answer. That's why we yeah. keep studying Mars. Well, we have that Mars 2020 rover that's going to yeah. go with more sophisticated abilities to look for these sorts of things. So, moving a little bit further out in the solar system, you might not think that all the way out at Jupiter, you could have a, a world that is uh, habitable because it's so darn cold and it's so much farther from the sun. But uh, Jupiter has four, has actually lots of moons. 61 is the count or something like that? 64? 73? Oh, it happens. To, I, they keep growing. Um, and, but uh, does anybody know the definitive number now? 79? Okay. 
We're thinking 79. If anyone has other, That's they sad. can tell us that. Anyway, uh, the four largest are these ones, which I always remember in order, and you can too, from I Eat Green Cats. Oh, God. <laughs> Sorry, that's what I remember. Uh, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Uh, Europa is the second one, and it's the smallest of the four. There, there they are, shown in uh, proper comparison of size to each other. And that's how they compare to Earth's moon. So you can see they're about Earth's moon or a little bit larger size, um, but they're, so they're pretty significantly sized world, worlds. Uh, the reason everyone's so excited about Europa is that Europa almost certainly, I mean to the very, very high degree of uh, reliability, has a huge ocean underneath its surface. One of the uh, first things you can see when you look at Europa are all these cracks on the surface and you can see they look like almost icebergs that are shifting around on the surface of something that's fluid and moving around. Europa has just an utterly fascinating um, surface with all kinds of indic indi indications of resurfacing uh, the surface layers. And um, measurements that were taken when we flew past uh, Europa in the 1990s with the Galileo probe took measurements of the magnetic field generated by what's thought to be a churning, salty ocean inside. So we really have a lot of strong uh, faith in this notion that Europa has a uh, big subsurface ocean. Now, of course, if we want to get down in there, life started on Earth in the oceans, we want to go into the ocean to find out uh, whether there's life in Europa, you would have to blast through miles of ice. And people have suggested we should take nuclear bombs there and bomb our way through and, you know, drill. It's very complicated. But there may be an easier way without having to bomb Europa. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and that is uh, from a set of observations that have been kind of trickling in all this decade. Uh, in 2013, uh, Hubble saw essentially a Rory glowing oxygen and hydrogen atoms. It wasn't water, but it was the ingredients of water, and they were ionized and floating, floating out, of the surf, uh, out from the surface in these little spouts or, or jets or sprays coming out. Um, it didn't see it all the time. It was intermittent, as you can sort of see from these different dates, but there it is in 2012, and it was nice and showed up beautifully, whereas in uh, uh, November it wasn't there. So it seems like it might be a spotty spout. Uh, in 2016, further observations also taken with Hubble, but these in absorption, looked again on several occasions, and most did not show any evidence of, of material coming out. But on three occasions, and you can see I'll kind of zoom into those three, there was evidence, again, of some enhancement in the material coming out, and it was coming out in exactly the same place that it was in the earlier Hubble measurements, a different type of study same location, and when you did the analysis, it was kind of about the same amount of water coming out. So they went back and looked at the Galileo data from the, uh, from the 1990s and saw that in that very spot where the uh, spout comes out, there are some big cracks, and those cracks are warm. That red on the map there is because it's slightly warmer. The infrared uh, mapping showed it that it's kind of a hot spot, which is what you might expect if there were warm sprays of gas coming from the inside of Europa. And then finally, measurements of the magnetic field, it's, that's where those lines are supposed to suggest magnetic field, showed disruption in exactly that same place. And again, when you did the math, it was exactly of the same scale of disruption that you might expect from the kinds of plumes that people were seeing in 2013 and 2016. This is going back now to look at data from the 1990s. And so all this picture is kind of fitting together that there could be a geyser or some kind of spray of water coming from the inside of Europa and spraying out. The reason that's so cool is you could just fly through it. You don't need to bomb the place anymore. You could have a, a detector and just scoop up some of that fluid, bring it back to Earth, and we could analyze it in a lab um, and see if there is life in it. That's actually not that hard to do. We do things like that and have done it before. So this latest result uh, is that um, there was another series of studies, but this time they looked specifically for water. Not H, not O, but H2O and did it from the ground from Hawaii Keck Telescope and looked again over a period of about 15 months. And uh, most of them showed nothing, 
but one actually had a nice little peak that suggests, nice little, this is a, a spectroscopic measurement, you don't have to worry about it, but the main thing is that the peaky looking thing is a glow from water. And there's kind of a close up of how they fit the spectrum, as we like to say. So it, it and it's water, so it's definitely water. And again, all the pieces are fitting together to a picture where there are these spouts coming out. So this is very exciting. We have a mission about to be sent to Europa. It's going to be launched in, uh, I think now the launch date slipped to 2025, called um, Clipper, Europa Clipper. And it's going to be able to get a good close-up look and measurements and see if indeed this or maybe other spouts exist that we can on a next mission uh, have a sample return and fly back. So here's a little picture of the uh, Europa Clipper mission. This is what NASA provided. We were absolutely, utterly intrigued by the blue lines they included. And, and so uh, we were wondering what it was, and, and here was the best answer we could come up with. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> we shall not see home again. <laughs> As Bill sent us a spoiler last week, he said they, they do see home again. So <laughs> they did, the, the Star Trek Enterprise did not perish on that uh, on the, in the Tholium web. All right. What? The song. Oh, you're so right. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Yes, I forgot that myself. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Uh, Carl, Carlos Santana. Why, why does the, uh, the spouts, if you will, or the emissions of water vapor disrupt the magnetic field? Uh, because there, there are ions in that, and um, ionized particles and magnetic fields interact in the way that ions who are, that are moving try to pull, like rubber bands, the magnetic field. Magnetic field tries so to push back. The motion of the, ion, mm -hmm. the ions coming out yeah. will disrupt. Okay. Yep. Thank you. All right, on to our other. And if you think that moon is cool, check out this moon, Saturn's moon Titan. We're, we're looking at that. Yes. I heard it here in front. So many Okay, yeah, Either whoever said Teen Titans, if you think you're even close to the first, you, you should come get a prize. We've got a lot of prizes, so you can get a prize. It's, it's the holiday season. Let's have some prizes. It's the um, time of year for calendars. Yeah. <laughs> Old ones. Um, so uh, this, of course, um, Saturn is way in the background, and we're close to Europa in this, uh, to Titan in this picture, so that is not meant to suggest that, uh, Europa, that Titan is any larger than Saturn. But Titan is a very mysterious world because it's the only known moon in the solar system that has a very thick atmosphere. And it's made up of main, mainly nitrogen, nitrogen like Earth's atmosphere is. So that's pretty cool. It also has methane, or as some say around here, methane. Uh, who would that and, uh, Who would say that? Uh, and hydrogen. And, uh, and it has a hydrocarbonological, that's a new word you can use at home. Uh, <laughs> rather than a hydrological, rather than a water cycle, it actually, you get evaporation and rain, not of water, but of hydrocarbons. It's so cold there that uh, hydrocarbons are, go through that kind of a cycle. So it's an intriguing world, and even more intriguing because we don't know what's underneath this vast, thick, hazy cloud layer, or we didn't know for the longest, longest, longest time. So uh, we sent a probe called Cassini, um, NASA did, with a Europe European little probe that went off and plowed through the clouds of Titan and sent back this movie, literally sent back this movie, <laughs> it's a little cleaned up, but of Titan's surface. And lo and behold, it's got mountains and river stream beds and it is the most Earth-like terrain anywhere in the solar system, all hidden under this a uh, hazy thing. So we've got a, 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 a fluid cycle and an Earth-like terrain and seasons. This is a pretty amazing world. It too has an ocean of water inside. So you've got uh, hydrocarbons or you know, hydrogen carbon things that are important for life. You've got water inside. What an amazing possible uh, world for life. So we want to know what's inside, what's behind those clouds, and the Cassini mission mapped the entire pla uh, uh, plant moon at a wavelength that allowed it to peer through the clouds. And uh, so just this past month, they published an entire global map of the terrain of Titan. 
So they took images like this and coded them according to different types of terrain and boiled it down to six primary terrains. Um, craters, plains, labyrinth, that's kind of a fun one, hummocky, it's just yeah. fun to say these things, lakes, Titan has lakes of liquid hydrocarbons on their surface and dunes. And uh, so if you kind of want to see examples of those kinds of terrains, here's a nice one. Uh, <laughs> all kind of, you could, hummocky. yeah, hummocky, I don't <laughs> Okay, <laughs> yeah, no, but no spoilers about Baby Yoda. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so they made an entire map of the surface of <laughs> Nice, Xanadu. Well, it's spoiler there. I was first going to say um, that, uh, before pointing out Xanadu, that we see geological maps like this all the time. It helps us understand the history, the geological history of our own world. So this is California. You can see there are different plates, different terrains, different things that happened at different times in Earth's history. You can derive a lot about the history about what happened to Earth by looking at these uh, geological maps. We have them of the moon, and uh, Sarah said in one of our meetings earlier, the moon's not very good at paintball. Uh, <laughs> so that's a, uh, we had to put that in there. Um, and uh, Mars has a full terrain map. Even Vesta, the, uh, at the I guess it's not a minor planet, is it? Because it's a, but it's a, or not a dwarf planet, but it's a, in the asteroid belt. So now we have one of Titan. And uh, yes, somebody already pointed out, that's where Olivia Newton-John is from. Uh, so anyway, uh, just jumping right to it, you can see there's a lot of really interesting things. The dunes are really concentrated toward the uh, equator. Um, and I mean, I, I don't have time. You could do a whole show on just Titan alone. But another cool thing. Uh, are the um, at the poles? This is now looking at the poles, north and south, is really where the lakes and the labyrinth uh, terrain are concentrated. <laughs> <laughs> Had to put, yeah. Can't have Olivia Newton-John and not David Bowie. So okay. So anyway, that's where uh, those terrains are. And so again, Titan is a very, very interesting world that has lakes on them on the surface, that means that there's means of liquid transport. Uh, so maybe it too has little aliens. Maybe, who can know? Well, we better go explore it and find out more. Okay, uh, so before we bring up our guest, we'd like to just um, tell you about a field trip we all went on uh, the Monday after the last Allspace uh, to Northrop Grumman. Northrop Grumman is an aerospace <coughs> corporation just down the road uh, and um, we wanted to go see the James Webb Space Telescope in the clean room, getting ready to be sent off to uh, Lagrange Point to do its observations in a couple of years. So we went to Northrop Grumman and learned a little bit late that we weren't supposed to be taking photographs. No. So Bill got arrested, spent a night in jail. No. Yeah. Uh, no, but he did get he did get reprimanded, but he snuck the picture out anyway, and we're sharing it with you. He's such a rebel. <laughs> and simultaneously, while he was walking up to the building, I was already in the lobby with Daniel and took this picture I wasn't supposed to take, but you know, there we go. Uh, and you can see the J James Webb Space Telescope is right there. It's so small, right? <laughs> so that, of course, is a little model hanging in the, uh, from the ceiling. So uh, we toured their museum and went into the viewing area at the clean room and looked at the amazing work being done in. And uh, yeah, if that looks fake, it is fake because of course we're not allowed to take that picture. So we had to do the uh, courtroom artwork and so we're, the rest of the story is. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so uh, before, uh, well, first we'll show you some official things we can show you. And this is a full long video, one minute. We don't usually play videos as long as this, but it's so cool to watch what they're doing. This is the uh, sunshade that is being deployed. It's going to provide uh, cooling to the telescope. You can read the titles yourself. And you can dance to the music. 
So there are five layers of this thin mylar stuff that will create a thermal barrier between the sun that will be behind the telescope and the telescope assembly itself. So of course this is in the green room. Everybody is in bunny suits, very uh, pristine condition because we don't want any junk to get into the telescope. So you can see he's on a lift there, and indeed while we were there, we saw, it's very amazing, amazing thing, we saw them on these lifts, and they had done the deploy of the sun shield, and so they were kind of folding it back up in order to get do another test to deploy it. So they were there just ever so carefully, all the people leaning over, and they had a camera hanging from uh, their wrists because they were down there taking pictures of every little thing. There was a moment we all gasped as the guy's camera kind of went he, he caught it. Oh. <laughs> Would have been bad if the camera got, but it was, you know, it was okay. I'm sure he's got, but to us, we were like, woo! Uh, so then, of course, because um, we never tell the truth here, uh, we, they let us in. And, you know, and in particular, we just thought Patrick had to drill a hole through the sunshine, you know? And that's, that's Jeff with the evil eyes, because Jeff did the artwork, so of course he... Uh, I know. Friends in high places. <laughs> how, how can we do that? You know somebody who works there. Know someone that works yeah, there? Have... Try contacting them and ask if they have a public event for a public tour. I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if Friends of the Observatory made some sort of arrangement for photo members to go, because that's been under discussion for some time. But I can't announce anything because nothing is finalized. But. There have been discussions to that end. So consider becoming a member of Friends of the Observatory. Uh, OK, so with that, uh, we'll move to our guest for this evening. David, Indeed. do you want yeah, to tell we'll us? We'll scoot down and all, and he might come on up. Um, uh, Dr. Mike Rich is from UCLA, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine. I worked with him for many years. Come on up, Mike. There's a pointer there if you need one. Um, <laughs> Gosh, I've known you since, oh, I don't know, a very long time. I remember seeing all these papers with uh, Rich on them and a Mike Rich and, and, and Some whatnot. Some of them have a rights on them. So, well, so <laughs> later they did, but originally I was in graduate yeah. school and I met you at a meeting in Belgium, believe it or not. It was oh, the first I place we met. Um, yeah, it was at... Must have been Ghent, the Galactic Bulb. Anyway. No, anyway, well, but, uh, so, but then later I ended up uh, working with him at UCLA for many years and um, still do. Still a colleague of mine. We do a little bit of work. And tonight you're here to talk to us about... Um, the work that you have led on the ghostly halos of nearby galaxies in a survey called the Heron Survey. Um, so I guess your mic is muted. Yeah, so if we you can unmute your so, mic. Okay. We we'll get that. But the Heron Survey is is interesting. It's using a a telescope that you, Mike, um, sort yeah, of. Yeah, it's a, uh, an interesting story. Now, where it should I? be on uh, the top here. There we go. Right. Perfect. Okay. Then we're all set. Okay. Um, so, but anyway, you're going to tell us all about that, about the observatory and about the work we've been doing. Yeah, thanks. In fact, and, uh, it's, welcome. Uh, the success is in large part due to collaboration with David. And uh, so uh, it's, a, it's an interesting story. Um, you, you know, I actually, um, uh, uh, work, you know, I work at UCLA, primarily use the Keck and Hubble Space Telescope and other large telescopes. Uh, one day, um, there is a colleague of mine, uh, actually from uh, the uh, 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 business department from, uh, uh, from Anderson School, and he approached me and said, hey, you know, I, I've heard about you know, telescopes for imaging, and I know you're a member of the Polaris Observatory Association, that small little observatory uh, uh, that is the competition to LA Astronomical Society. Both are in Lockwood Valley. Uh, so, you know, I, and I said, well, yeah, this sounds interesting, but, you know, I, I'm just so busy with my uh, data and my uh, students and projects, so I don't have time to work on this. You can see here, this is a picture of the observatory uh, back in, uh, oh gosh, I think uh, 1970. Um, and so it's been around for a while, and there's Francis in his office. And, um, and then, you know, I had experience, though, with small telescopes, because I worked on the Galaxy Evolution Explorer satellite. Uh, and uh, that's a 20-inch telescope, very successful. It's been, it was in space for 10 years, thousands of papers that have been written based on the data. I was on the science team 
There's an image there of uh, M31 in ultraviolet light. Not a single bit of that light in that image is optical light that your eyes could see normally. Uh, the, uh, uh, the spiral arms have stars that are forming out of hydrogen, very massive stars in the center are helium burning stars that are 10 billion years old, whose nature we still don't completely understand because they're glowing in the ultraviolet, yet they're very old stars. Uh, the other kind of connection I have with small telescopes is very interesting. You know, I was at Columbia University for 10 years. Uh, one of my doctoral students is kind of slightly known, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, <laughs> another of my students is maybe slightly not so known, but also considerable importance, and that's Edgar Smith. And uh, he decided for his thesis to build his own telescope. He was a man of some substance, and he decided to build this telescope, which will now become the spectroscopic monitor telescope for the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope in Chile. Now, when he built this telescope, there is this little interesting story that Don Neal, another person who worked with me, was there. He was taking a while to focus the telescope, and this, this guy, Jim Riffle, who was also on the project, finally blew a gasket and quit that night. And he decided that he was going to build a telescope that would be based on this design with a graphite epoxy truss. Uh, and little did I know that I would intersect with Jim Riffle. And the way that happened was that so here I, you know, this is my thesis student. He had designed this telescope, which uh, was supposed to image as well as the Hubble Space Telescope from the ground. Well, it didn't work out that way. It's very difficult to do that. Very, very difficult. You need a big telescope, lots of lasers, and then you can only do it in the infrared. Uh, and so it's a long story. You need adaptive optics and, you know, very complex. And this, this was supposed to be a perfect mirror. He, in fact, it was, the mirror was produced by Perkin Elmer. Uh, we know you know, the story about their perfect mirror for the Hubble, the one that was a spherical <laughs> aberration. <laughs> but so he put them, if I can tell you this, that if he had been in charge of producing the Hubble mirror, it would not have had spherical aberration. Because they were terrified he's going to sick his lawyers on them. It's, oh, my goodness. Anyway, so we get back to the story of what happened. So Francis Longstaff approached me and says, you know, Mike, um, there's a 28-inch telescope that we had buy for you know a fairly reasonable amount, a, an amount of money that was maybe a fifth what a what a one-meter telescope, one-meter class telescope should cost. And I said, oh, okay, I'll go in house with you on this, uh, and, and you know we get this telescope. There it is, uh, and, and back you can see it uh, uh, in Arizona, and then that's the first light night you can actually see the primary mirror at at Polaris Observatory. And it's like a new baby. I don't know what I'm going to do with it, but you know, <laughs> it's change kind of it, exciting. Change it. <laughs> kind of, yeah, exactly. Yeah, change. Well, there's been a lot of yeah. It's it's very interesting. There's a lot of hands-on stuff that goes yeah. on with that telescope. Actually, uh, it's fascinating. Yeah. So then, um, you know, the thing that was unique about this compared to a lot of amateur telescopes or small telescopes is the CCD is at the prime focus. Okay, mm -hmm. so. It, most of the time, the CCD is behind the mirror, but uh, with this telescope, CCD is at prime. It's a big enough uh, primary that it doesn't obstruct much light. So I, you know, now I wasn't aware at the time, but there was this little competition called Dragonfly that has 48 lenses. This is before having the full 48 lenses. Now, my project is less than 100,000. Theirs is well over several million. Uh, I went online and I said, well, you know, I'm going to compete with, with this project, and, and I, I want to come up with a name. So I said, what kind of birds eat dragonflies? <laughs> <laughs> Herons, they eat dragonflies. I said, well, what can I, I was like, oh, I to come up with this name. What can I, you know, acronym? So the Halos <laughs> and Environments of Nearby Galaxies is my acronym. So, so far the, the dragonflies have been doing very well, but you know what has to be persistent. I, and as David Wright's lawyer knows, I don't give up. So the subject <laughs> of, of studying the universe at low surface brightness has been something that is, uh, we've known about this, well, since the 1950s, actually. I mean, there's nothing, you know, a lot of things that just aren't that new in astronomy. In fact, John Cormody is also on the paper pointed out that when he was a graduate student at Caltech, he and John Bacall, who was a very famous, ended up being a very famous physicist, nearly won the Nobel Prize, used the 18-inch Schmidt at Palomar to image uh, galaxies, and they studied the ghostly halos back then. 
and detected much of what we're seeing, came to some of the some similar conclusions. The person that really hit it out of the park, though, was in the 1980s, this fellow, David Maley, who did uh, what was called unsharp masking. And uh, so this is on the left, you see NGC 5128, which is uh, a, the nearest active galactic uh, nucleus that is truly active inside an elliptical galaxy. And you see those shells outside. We didn't know about those shells until the deep photographic imaging of the 1980s. Uh, then it was understood that those are caused by a galaxy falling in and kind of reverberating and bouncing back and forth. Malin 1 is a disk galaxy that is nearly as big as the Milky Way, but quite faint. And uh, uh, it's barely, it's got a lot of hydrogen, very few stars, but a giant disk. And so we were making, the, this field was making discoveries. Then there was just at the time that I was commissioning this telescope, this paper by Martinez Delgado, and it just had these pretty pictures. <laughs> uh, and these were galaxies that were, uh, these images were taken with a, a half meter telescope, even smaller, but for tens and tens of hours. And suddenly, you know, galaxies were shown to have umbrellas and, you know, see the umbrella on the lower right there uh, and, and all sorts of interesting structures. So I said, yeah, I think I, I, this is something worth doing. Now, one of my favorite galaxies is NGC 4449. Actually, up at Polaris, we have a 28-inch telescope. And when I take guests there in the spring, I love to show them that galaxy. I say, uh, you know, if you could be around 100 million years after the Big Bang, every galaxy you see would be something like this. In fact, on a very clear night, is you can actually see it resolve into clusters and little, it's just fascinating. It's a blue galaxy. So I decided I was going to hit that galaxy hard and just see what was there. And well, I, I managed to get a result, discovered uh, a little dwarf galaxy there that ended up in this little journal called Nature. Uh, it was uh, actually I was in competition with, the, uh, with another team, with the Delgado, uh, Martinez Delgado team. And it got to be a little hot and heavy. Uh, <laughs> we published at the same time. They went into AppJ letters. Uh, but you know, it was a cool thing. I, uh, uh, found this, uh, we subtracted the light of the NGC 4449, which you can see on the left, the, the black and white uh, uh, negative image, and you can see that there's this giant tadpole left over there and some other interesting structures, which I won't go into, but it's a fascinating thing. There's a whole, the, the, the exciting part that you can see with your eye is the high surface brightness part right in the middle of the disk. Uh, and so, here was the publicity thing. I wanted to show how big the dwarf we had found. So I said if we dropped it on top of the Milky Way, it would span from our position to the Milky Way into the center of the galaxy. Even though it was very faint, you know, even though this little tadpole thing is faint, it's big. And, and it's, you know, it, it would reach from the position of the sun right to the center of the Milky Way. Okay, so. Uh, and then we looked at some other galaxies, which finally got around to publishing. It just takes so long to write this stuff up. That's the challenge. Uh, but here, you, you can see some, if you're an amateur astronomer, you probably recognize uh, the names of some of these galaxies. Uh, and, uh, but you can see they look awfully different in these pictures, like M51 there in the lower uh, uh, left. That, that is uh, uh, really amazing. You can see the main galaxy, which through a telescope, you can see the spiral arms. But there's this giant you know, paisley halo that extends 300,000 light years around it. Hmm. Now to the upper right, NGC uh, 44, uh, I think it's 4372. That one, when you look at it with your eye, it looks like a sliver. Um, but with uh, hair on, you see a shoe. <laughs> I call the galaxy the shoe, and so on. So you see all these interesting things, but now you've got to do science, which we'll talk about in a, in a bit. Uh, this is my comparison between uh, my telescope. That's 35 hours on Dragonfly versus 40 minutes. You can see uh, on that, you know, this is like, it's a lot of time, 35 hours. That's a whole month of observing time. And we got most of the salient features in 40 minutes. So we've got a fast machine here. And actually, this colleague from Spain, um, Javier Roman, I was getting discouraged because, you know, Dragonfly has lots of money and lots of people. But he, he started to look at the data from my telescope a few months ago. And he said, 
Mike, this is the greatest telescope on Earth to do this kind of work. Like, oh my God, you know, I just, you know, I'm sitting here running this telescope from my house in Lockwood Valley, and well, as you'll see, it's starting to get very exciting. Now, here's a bit of the science and why this is so interesting. Uh, these are simulations by James Bullock and Katherine Johnston showing in the middle is dark matter simulations, and on the side are some of the Martinez Delgado images. Um, and you can see these streamers and so forth. Um, what, you know, what you can see some of the things in the dark matter. The dark matter is this, of course, mysterious substance. We don't know what it is. Um, it doesn't give off light. It just makes gravity. And every time you try to figure out what it is, it, the, the particle gets smaller and more elusive. We have <laughs> no idea what it is. Um, so you can ask the question, what is dark matter? And I've already answered it. Okay. <laughs> In fact, we can look at the assembly. I'm going to show you something. If I hope this works. I'm going to hold our breath here and see if this actually works. Nine times out of ten, it doesn't. But we'll, uh, this is a, um, uh, uh, the formation of, a, of something like the Milky Way galaxy. Now, you're starting out at very high redshift here, just after the Big Bang. Everything you see in this picture is actually not emitting starlight. There, this is all dark matter, and it's falling together under the force of gravity. So what we have here is that we started out with little quantum fluctuations, the dark matter falls in, and then we build this, you know, larger, you can see these larger structures, and at the end, you see something that looks awfully a lot, you know, you could think, if you think of the Milky Way, there's the main galaxy, a couple big satellites like the Cloud of Magellan, this is a theoretical simulation from a few years ago. Now, these aren't all perfect, and that's a whole other talk. There's uh, some of these things there. You can see there are many, many small structures there. Uh, we don't actually see dark matter counterparts for those. It's called the missing satellite problem. Well, anyway, getting back to my uh, NGC 4449, here's an image from the Galaxy Evolution Explorer satellite. And it actually, it's very blue. It's got lots of stars popping off. And in fact, when I first examined the image, it was uh, very exciting. It looked like there were jets shooting out of the galaxy, but actually it was so bright that it was uh, uh, bouncing off of the wires in the detector. <laughs> <laughs> and this is an image that Francis Longstaff made. This is our discovery image showing the little dwarf. And uh, you could see there's a lot of structure in that galaxy. And then this is a color image, and you could see the blue as the star formation regions and the uh, uh, the, the red is kind of uh, uh, what we call ionized hydrogen region lit up by the hot stars. Uh, this is a theoretical model that shows that the dwarf, which has dark matter in it, encountering a nucleus of the galaxy and then being slowly uh, spread apart. And in the third frame there, you could see it kind of being torn apart, and that's where we think we're observing it now, 100 million years after the encounter. I'll skip through some other things. Uh, this is from an old space telescope proposal. They didn't give it time, unfortunately. But uh, you could see the galaxy actually changing shape as you look deeper uh, and uh, take a deeper cut versus the sky. And you see the little tadpoles sticking out. Um, I'll skip past this. It's a little technical. But what we're doing is looking for other things like the dwarf. So above that main flood of galaxies there, uh, there's a pink and a blue one. So we were looking at various candidates. One of them turned out to be uh, mispublished, but the other one turned out to be a similar galaxy, but who we, we don't know why it's being uh, disrupted. And we discovered the similar galaxy here. Um, and we still don't know which galaxy is the culprit causing it to uh, be torn apart. But this is kind of a second example known in our local volume. And then we made another interesting discovery, and this is a plot of the absolute magnitude of the galaxy versus the diameter of the halo. And we found that the more luminous intrinsically the galaxy is, the bigger the halo it has. And so that uh, could, now we think that those ghostly halos may to some extent outline the extent of the dark matter halo that the galaxy lives in. So we're looking at trying to relate these uh, giant halos to uh, the dark matter. Um, and I'll show a few other pretty pictures. This is NGC 205 with tidal tails. And then this one, uh, this is near, this is a, a, a satellite around the Andromeda galaxy. And this one I like, this shows that the multi-million dollar, they used to call the Hubble Space Telescope, the billion dollar Hubble Space Telescope. 
Well, I want to call Dragonfly the million dollar Dragonfly telescope because we're doing just pretty much just as well, if not better. We actually, uh, we do have some diffraction spikes that they don't have because they have camera lenses, but we have uh, smaller images than they have generally. So um, this is the Coma cluster of galaxies. It's 300 million light years away, and it's a, a huge structure. What you're looking at there is nearly a million light years across. Um, this is uh, a galaxy. This is, we're just writing up this paper, just about to submit it. This is, uh, that, that spiral arm is around a normal elliptical galaxy, and, and that uh, galaxy is UGC 4449, and we, uh, that, that is a, a 100,000 light years sized spiral arm that is just sitting yeah. out there whose nature we don't completely that, know. That arm's yeah. not forming stars, is it? It is. It's forming stars okay. because we, sus we strongly suspect it's Any blue, and it's got, also we have a, I should have put in a beautiful image, from the Discovery Channel telescope, but it's very blue in the UV. Yeah. Any detection with Galax? Yes, in fact, okay. in the paper we have uh, Galax, I mean, they just barely detected it because we didn't, nobody really realized it had seen it, but when on closer examination, it had not exposed that long, we were able to pull out that spiral arm very in, cool. in the far UV. So it's definitely forming stars, and we don't exactly know what's going on there. Um, and Here's another, this is now our fifth 45 hour image of the entire uh, uh, coma region with uh, all those other galaxies around that are uh, giant galaxies. I just That was day three of Woodstock? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I love showing, this is another one that my colleagues put together that, is, that has really turned out nice. And what we want to do, we're in the midst of doing uh, we've got a lot of papers to write up, but you see this is x-ray gas. And what we're trying to do is to match up the x-ray gas with the faintest starlight and try to show, uh, try to understand if the faintest starlight is in fact following the dark matter in this cluster of galaxies. And, and the x-ray gas we strongly suspect is following the dark matter. Um, so uh, this is another, these are different views of x-ray and then Here's another view of the x-ray gas that uh, we think we see, this is very exciting for us, we think we see the, for the first time a clear luminous connection of uh, the hmm. low surface brightness material between the bulk of coma that follows the x-ray gas to that other wow. galaxy. So kind of, kind of interesting. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing when, you know, what you, what you start to appreciate, uh, and I don't know if the, um, the image may, it may not have made it in here, but I actually do a head-to-head -head comparison with the CFHT telescope on Mauna Kea. Now, it's kind of unfair to CFHT because they have some optics that make a lot of internal reflections, but we, uh, in the same length of exposure time, I see just as faint surface brightness. So it's like having a four-meter telescope, you know, that I can control from home in Lockwood Valley, <laughs> to some extent, if you're doing the right thing, okay, you've got to do the right kind of science, but it's really cool. For example, here is, uh, this is uh, NGC 7331, um, and uh, this is, we actually discovered, I don't know if I could point it out, but there's a little, like, pad, it's a, hot, a little hard to see, yeah, but you do have a one of the, uh, so if I, I have to go up here, but I think it's, well, it may be hard to see, but I think here, one of the dwarfs we found has kind of paddle-like structures that go out uh, 16 kiloparsecs. And this was the first time that it had been seen. Now, uh, what you see here, uh, what's going on here, there's a lot of action. There's the bulge. There's all these satellites. There's a lot of structure here because we're looking through what's called the galactic cirrus. Now, that's not cirrus in the sky, and it's not clouds. It's clouds of dust that are reflecting light from the disk of the Milky Way. And when you go down to these surface brightness levels, which is 30th magnitude per square arc second, which is really faint, you actually have to deal with correcting for things like this cirrus. Um, another thing, there was a big controversy about these galaxies. You may have heard about several galaxies that seem to lack dark matter. Why did they lack dark matter? Um, you know, the, most of the dwarf galaxies are supposed to have uh, uh, are observed to have dark matter. Um, so we did a 50-hour image, again, 
taken from my home late at night. Uh, my wife was not keen on this going on, <laughs> but I did it anyway. It was, it was crazy. I did, you know, I was up all night taking these things and stumbling into class the next day. Um, and what we found was that in this area where there were these dwarf galaxies, there are lots of streamers. Some of the dwarf galaxies, like this one here, um, have clear, uh, let's see if I can, uh, there, uh, the there laser is, yeah. uh, the, and there's also a stronger uh, okay. pointer. If you need uh, it. Okay, maybe this, ah, uh, yes, I think I'll go with the, see if I can, yes, there we go. So, see all this stuff here? That's all material being stripped off of this galaxy. Now, this is one of the dwarfs. This is one that supposedly doesn't have dark matter. Well, look at that, seen for the first time. So we're not sure that they're connected, you know, the, but it's certainly there's a lot of suspicion that the reason these galaxies don't show the dark matter is because they, that they are undergoing, experiencing, or have experienced substantial tidal stripping. So it may not be as exotic as, as the dragonfly team uh, thinks. So anyway, uh, <laughs> at the last meeting I was at, I said, you know, well, we have this beautiful image. They said, oh, we have a deeper one. I said, well, if you do, publish it. You know, that's silence. Then we also, <laughs> 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 so we have a, a, tele, a sister telescope in Israel, the Wise Observatory, which I helped to commission and get going. And this uh, uh, telescope, uh, discovered this very nice little, see this plume here? That, that little plume there, 30th magnitude per square arc second, I think the total extent of that is 600,000 light years. So that's a Hickson so, compact group. So by the way, 30, 30th magnitude per square arc second, those are insanely faint features, yeah. let me yeah. just say. Like, yeah. Those, those like are mind-blowing numbers. 20 night, years ago, nobody could talk about that. The night sky at Lockwood Valley is, um, gosh, you know, 22 magnitudes on a good night. So you're going incredibly hundreds of times fainter than the night sky, and you have to dig this out through a lot of processing, which we're still improving and working on. Um, but actually, you know, some of this stuff, it's really funny because some of these features do show up. In fact, on NASA Skyview, just for fun, I went and pulled down the digital sky survey scanned uh, blue plates and I was able to just barely see that little tail, mm. and I was able to see both of the dragonfly galaxies. Said, oh, well, you need special processing to see these. No, you don't. You can see those two dwarfs. <laughs> Is there anyone just from the dragonfly collaboration? Yeah. 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 Can, do you just want to make sure we don't. I bottle? I know. I, 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 I get us. the chairs. <laughs> they're yeah. hitting. Yeah, that's right. I may need an arm desk court to get out. <laughs> No, I'm not saying they're bad. I actually, we're all, you know, all of us doing this. Actually, you know, there's a tendency for this generation to think, oh, I'm, we're the smartest, we're the best, you know, we, we, we figured it all out. But actually, a lot of this stuff, um, and I remember uh, when I worked with Alan Sandage, he would take me over and show these plates to me. And, you know, the, there were faint structures that you could see but could never be printed. And back in the day, they didn't have digital systems that you, you had to print things and, and actually printing photographs properly was itself an art to see the faint features. But these things were, were actually detectable amazingly. In fact, I, I would love to try to get access to the plate vaults and see how much of these things I could recover from. Because, you know, you can just go online and recover some of them from the Palomar Sky Survey plates. It's just, it's just cra it's crazy. It, it is it's possible. Yeah. So, I mean, they, there is this, this paper, which I did with David. Thank you. Uh, David really saved the day we're, because there's a lot of, of quantitative work he was an expert in that uh, uh, helped to make this happen. Uh, and uh, so we have a lot of, of interesting science. And the nice thing is, this is all, all the images. And uh, Dragonfly, if you're listening, you probably already down, down Russia if you're listening. No, <laughs> they probably have downloaded all my images already and God knows what they're going to do to me. But these are all, I made them all available to the public. Um, and actually my student Chester here helped with some of the, uh, he's here tonight and, and he helped with create some of the, the uh, JPEGs to, uh, so that uh, people can quickly see what features are detected. Chester, well, who are you? Let's see who Chester is. Chester Lee. Hi, yep. Chester. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, th this is all publicly available. If you're interested in 
seeing uh, how we did it, you can just download those images and we'll um, actually be reprocessing them and putting up better and better images over time. And here is our sister telescope at uh, WISE Observatory. That's the uh, telescope dome under construction. It's the round dome in the front that has the sister 28-inch telescope. Uh, it was very funny because my collaborators were saying, oh, but come on, you, yeah, they, they have it fully robotic, which I don't, but they get a lot of trailed images, ha <laughs> ha. So if, you see, by staying up all night, you know, I get really good data. And Javier says, oh my God, Mike, this is fantastic. Oh, it's better than last night. You know, it's like he really gets me excited to stay up all night and take these data. <laughs> so, but you know, my other telescope is a 10 meter telescope and we're gonna have this is going to be a coming attraction, which is kind of a little top secret. This is a Lyman Alpha Nebula, and that is three. That line is 300 physical kiloparsecs at that redshift, which is 2.91, and you can see see three streams coming in. Possibly there may even be a fourth stream superimposed on this Lyman Alpha Nebula. There is no quasar there, and that's interesting because it's Lyman Alpha and you need a source of hard UV photons to rip those electrons off of the atoms uh, so they can recombine, you see the Lyman Alpha. So this is a very significant thing not to have a source, a known source of photoionization. That leaves the gravitational contraction of the neutral hydrogen falling into the dark matter uh, perhaps forming a galaxy cluster like the Coma galaxies, but now we're looking at this just 100 million years after the Big Bang, and this would be the first case of cold flow accretion, which I should celebrate with the appropriate beer if we're actually going to be right. <laughs> but that's another all space considered, perhaps, for next year. <laughs> if, it, if it all pans out, we've got five more like these. So. And, and so that's, uh, if you have any uh, questions, uh, yeah. be delighted to answer them. Otherwise, I'll sing Ness and Dorma. So you no. want to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've been reading about beryllium and hydrogen and unique uh, uh, decay patterns in a new particle. Do you have any uh, uh, comments on the fifth-fourths of nature uh, stuff from the Hungary? I don't matter? know particularly exactly what you're referring to. Although when I hear beryllium and hydrogen, I think of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So the question is, the, um, for those who are following online, is that um, it was about beryllium and hydrogen, possibly fifth force new. And I, I have to apologize that I'm not familiar with this report, so I couldn't. Yeah, really I, comment. I saw something about that, but don't remember. Yeah, the I saw something too and didn't read it actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it'll have to be on so the next we'll all space consider. Yeah. Uh, but I sounds very that. interesting. I wish I could answer it. Um, yes. Michael, who made your telescope? It's really uniquely adapted. So, so Jim Riffle. And you just said, someone said it was for sale. Who built it and oh. for what purpose? Well, the story is that James Riffle saw this design that Edgar Smith had made, and he thought it was a brilliant design because the uh, Sororier Trust, which has to do a lot of the weight bearing, was made of rolled graphite epoxy composite. And so he just, you know, and then he worked with this Russian guy, Kraftsov, and they came up with a design for a hyperbolic primary and a two element Ross corrector. So two lenses in front of the CCD. So the question was who made the telescope and why? Uh, so they built a bunch of 18 inch telescopes, which by the way, have been very productive in the near earth object and asteroid discovery business. And then he built three C28 telescopes. And, that, and um, one of them is in Lockwood Valley, and one of them is at Wise Observatory. Yes. Do you have anything to say about the C18 and the, uh, uh, the dragonfly array? <coughs> oh, well, OK. There's the, the C18. Uh, it can be said in public. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about the C18 and the dragonfly array, but we actually have two C18s at um, at Polaris that are in getting com close, one of them is almost commissioned, um, but right now I just, there's a flood of data that is coming in that, you know, we, we've, I, I could see possibly 10 years of papers in the data we already have, which is really 
scary. I'm continuing to take data and just you know go deeper and wider and all that. But uh, uh. well. Oh, okay. Can you explain this image again? Because I didn't understand the thing you said. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, the question is, please explain the image that we're all looking at here. Okay, so this was taken with a remarkable instrument called the Keck Cosmic Web Imager at, at uh, Keck Observatory. It was designed by Chris Martin, who was the principal investigator of the Galaxy Evolution Explorer. Actually, I hope he's been here for All Space Considered. He, he, he should be here and he talk about. He absolutely should, and that's my fault because you, you, I know. You've got to have him talk I about Galax. I've thought and, about him uh, and then forget everything. Yeah, this because this <laughs> instrument. I'll come to that one. This this instrument that he built is absolutely amazing, and it's it's what we call an integral field spectrograph. So, you take an image of the sky, and every little piece of it, you get a spectrum out. Um, now this required this image required something, I think it was uh, eight hours of time on the Keck telescope uh, doing what we call a mosaic. Now what we're seeing here is light uh, from uh, Lyman Alpha. So Lyman Alpha is the transition from the second to the first level of the hydrogen atom. It's what we call the resonance transition. Okay, it has 10 electron volts of energy. Well, in, my, in Astro 3 I talk about you know, the electron volt is a cryptocurrency, and it's really fun because I talk about trillion electron volts is like a little bit of the U.S. debt and all that <laughs> stuff. Okay, but getting back to, to the Lyman Alpha. So this light is Lyman Alpha, but that has a wavelength of 1,200 angstroms, which is very short, gives you a bad sunburn. But we're able to see this at optical light because of the redshift. So this is uh, this nebula. We're seeing this nebula, but it's at a redshift of 2.91 which puts it out about 11 billion light years, 11, 12 billion light years, it's a good ways away. And we're actually seeing um, If this I may light. just throw in, yeah. just to define redshift yeah. in case that helps, it means how it's rushing away from us. Yeah. And so it's shifted the light red. Just, yes, that's right. Yeah. It's, when, it's like when you hear a train you know, going by you and the, 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 the frequency drops. Well, when something moves away from us, the light is red shifted. So, the universe is expanding, and we're seeing this not long after the Big Bang. And this, we think, may turn into a giant cluster of galaxies like the Coma Cluster. And so the, the central part, you know, will be where galaxies are. Some, of, some galaxies are forming right now. We think they're forming hundreds of stars per year right in that center part. And then soon, in cosmic time, they'll get a, the party will really get going, and they'll make a lot of galaxies. Yeah. Now, what you had said, and uh, what was interesting about this is, Lyman alpha is generally created when hydrogen recombines, when an electron finds a proton and says, "Let's make hydrogen." So those electrons had to be stripped off of that hydrogen somehow. It had to be ripped off of those nuclei. There's nothing there to do that. Normally, you need a quasar, an active galactic nucleus. Nothing was seen there. So this yeah. is the size of a cluster of galaxies that all this hydrogen somehow had its electrons ripped off, we don't know what did it, and it's all falling back together and glowing to form a giant cluster of galaxies. So a super interesting place to go That's study. That's absolutely we seen right. This. And in fact, you know, up to now, the Europeans, see there's always competition in astronomy. <laughs> they have their instrument called MUSE that does this kind of thing. But every time they look and they see something interesting like this, there's a quasar doing the photoionizing. So the principal investigator of that mission who were, uh, you know, he, he got furious at that, he said, oh, well, the quasar's got to be there. It just turned off. And <laughs> uh, no, yeah, well, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it just shut off. I mean, there are reasons to think that, in fact, AGN are variable, and they can, you know, we're looking at a big black hole having dinner, and it may take, <laughs> it may take a break, you know, may get an upset tummy or something. I was going to say it's taking a <laughs> postprandial nap. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's unlikely. And I, for various reasons, uh, we think. But, you know, we're going to have a doozy of a time getting this past Leslie Sage. Anyway, that's a <laughs> um, <laughs> That's an two, inside joke. Two last questions, one here and one there, and then we'll okay. move on. Yeah. Question I have on, the, on this image here where we have uh, three apparent streams. Are they streaming away from the center structure? Are they streaming away from the us as being the observer? And then what is the stream composed of? <laughs> okay, the easiest question is, it's composed of hydrogen. Okay. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, are they streaming in or out? It's complicated because they're kind of moving. We're still doing analysis to get that. The theory says that the streams should be uh, cold uh, coming in from the reservoir of neutral hydrogen that was left over from the Big Bang. It's flowing in. Okay. It's going to start forming stars and galaxies in the middle there. So that, that's what we think. So we think it's flowing in. But uh, we're still working on demonstrating that for a fact. Thank you. Thank you. So just to be clear, is this potentially like the uh, formation of a cluster? But you're not sure yet? Is that right? So the question is, is this potentially the formation of a cluster of galaxies? I say almost certainly because we have several sources detected with the Atacama Large Millimeter Array that you know, are indicative of galaxies already forming, yes. So if that's the case, is there a potential that this is the earliest picture of a formation of a cluster? It is one of the earliest. And in fact, one of the aims of this program is to look back, because in fact, as, as you may know, and you seem to be pretty knowledgeable, most clusters are not seen until, you know, looking, looking past Redshift 1, it gets hard, then at Redshift 2, or so the, the previously most distant known cluster was called the Wang cluster, uh, detected in X-rays. Um, so, you know, getting, detecting giant clusters of galaxies in the act of formation at this redshift is a pretty big deal. Yes? Would the Webb telescope, if they were looking at that, if it was up in orbit, would that improve that picture, the Webb? Uh, yes, the Webb could do a number of things, and if you're on the time allocation committee, uh, <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> yeah. Right. We, there's a lot. We, we actually are getting time with the Hubble, and what we're doing with the Hubble is actually, we're not trying to look at the nebula because the Hubble doesn't have the right instruments to do that, but we are looking at the galaxies right in the middle. We just got a very mysterious, deep image with Alma, and we saw fewer galaxies than we kind of expected, hmm. which is interesting. So this is a very mysterious object. <clears throat> OK, yeah, well, you. yeah, thank, thank you again, Mike, for joining us. Thank you, David. Yeah. 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 Really fantastic. Why don't, you, why don't you stay here while we yeah. finish our last part? There's, oh, you, can, sure. you might have something to comment on. So moving on to uh, just before the end and right before break is our sky report. So Patrick, tell us what's in the sky okay, for December. So, uh, we'll share some uh, more stories of the sky with you for this December. Um, starting with last month and later last month, uh, we watched uh, with great interest uh, two planets, uh, Jupiter and Venus, actually move. Yes, OK, <laughs> excellent. Everybody gets a prize. <laughs> OK, so yes, a conjunction. So um, uh, we can go, oh, I'm, I'm in control of this. <laughs> okay, so November 18th, two, the two planets. I photographed this. Uh, there's, uh, whoa, wait, go back. Um, laser here. There's uh, Venus, there's Jupiter. And we um, also uh, photographed uh, Jupiter and Venus over a, s a few nights from uh, November 21st through to 23rd. And you can see how it moves each day. It's really quick. So uh, there's a repeat. There's Jupiter, uh, Venus on the bottom there, and getting closer and closer to Jupiter uh, each evening. So um, that was a fascinating event. Yeah. Now, in, if you missed all of that, and it's been cloudy, um, uh, there's more. Because on uh, December 10th, and you can mark your calendars, uh, uh, Venus will catch up to Saturn, and it will be separated by four degree, uh, actually four moon diameters. And in addition, there's even more. On the 28th, um, so put that down on your calendar, the moon will be just about a one moon diameter below Venus in the evening wow. sky. Oh, that so, would be beautiful. That'll be and beautiful. that's a very, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's definitely worth um, taking a photograph with the uh, crescent moon and brilliant Venus just above it. So um, what do these planets look like? Well, uh, Venus right now is a, a, uh, actually like a waxing gibbous. And in the center there, Jupiter, we're going to lose our view of Jupiter. In fact, we're losing it right now um, as it slips into the uh, bright twilight. Uh, you can still kind of see Jupiter, but it's, it's seen with difficulty through a telescope. And uh, the rings of Saturn are still wide open, and you can still see um, Saturn um, uh, kind of in the twilight right now. But um, 
our telescopes on the lawn, if you come up, you can look through the telescope and maybe get a view of Saturn, and that's what it would kind of look like. And now, um, if you're interested in identifying constellations in the evening sky, um, middle of the month, uh, 9 p.m., you can see your winter favorites. Uh, there's Orion the Hunter with its three stars in its, in its belt. And um, just above it, um, there's a bright star called Aldebaran. And below it, um, if you follow the belt downwards uh, from Orion, and it's right there, you find this brilliant star Sirius. And all of this is seen in the southeast. Uh, and Sirius right now is low enough that it flashes due to atmospheric turbulence in all colors of the rainbow. And normally, people call in and say, I've just seen this brilliant object, and it's flashing in all colors of the rainbow. Why is that? Oh, it's Sirius. So <laughs> not a UFO. <laughs> it's not it's, a UFO. It's identified. It's UFO, yeah. yeah. Right. OK, so that's the evening sky. Um, in the morning sky on December 20th, just about uh, less than two hours before sunrise, you can see um, uh, Mars, which is uh, over in the east. It's way over here in the southeast. Uh, there's the uh, waning crescent moon uh, just above the star Spica, and Leo the Lion. Leo the Lion is a constellation that has a backwards question mark uh, shape for its head and mane, ending in this bright star called Regulus, and its hindquarters is made out of a triangle. So uh, that's uh, worth going out to see if you're an early morning um, a person. Uh, uh, well, which I am not. Or so. a super late. <laughs> oh, super late. Person. Oh, you stay up. Oh, like Mike would stay up That's right, <laughs> all yeah. the way to the early morning. And, uh, I have an old sky camera, too. It's really fun. You get yeah. into it. <laughs> <laughs> See, I wanted to ask about that interstellar comet. Is that, you know, I heard it's going to get bright, but not bright enough probably to vis be visible to the naked eye. What about telescopically visible? Oh, yeah. Well, no, I th I, I'm remembering it. 14th mag, something like that. Yeah, but, but it may be in the it, southern sky, right? I, I think it is moving yeah, to the south. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. 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 Got to catch a flight. Yeah. Mm. OK. <laughs> OK, so um, in fact, uh, the next day, uh, we have the solstice. Yeah. And uh, we've actually reached the point where the sun is fr seen from the northern hemisphere, and especially here in Los Angeles, its lowest point in the sky, which is just about 32 degrees above, this, uh, about the noon, noontime position. In the summer, it climbs, um, in the summer solstice, it climbs up to 79 degrees. So that's a big contrast there. And what does this mean? This means a change of seasons. For us in the northern um, hemisphere, it's the first day of winter. And uh, in the southern hemisphere, it's the first day of summer. So, uh, you know, if you uh, want to experience summer, go down there and take a trip and uh, mm -hmm. pick up an ice cream cone and walk around the beach and in 80 to 90 degree temperatures. Okay, and uh, our moon phases. Uh, so <laughs> we did something special for our moon phases. So uh, uh, one thing uh, to note is um, if you want to come uh, up to see a lot of telescopes on our lawn, uh, come up on the 7th of... Uh, That's of tomorrow. Actually, tomorrow. <laughs> and, um, and you can... Um, uh, look through any telescopes, uh, many of them provided by Los Angeles Astronomical Society and, and other astronomical societies, and of course our own telescopes, and uh, take a peek at, um, at Saturn and all the other objects um, that's available in the evening sky. We have a full moon on the, uh, on the 11th, and then uh, on, after that, on the 12th, actually the 13th and the 14th, there is a special event. And that event is the Geminid meteor shower, the last major meteor shower of this year uh, on a good night without any, um, any moon, which is uh, unfortunately right uh, at this time, uh, the moon's in the ways, you can normally see about 120 meteors per hour. So that's, wow. it's a very active shower. Uh, but unfortunately, the moon is in the way. And you can see where the meteors radiate. They come from this radiant right here at the uh, near the stars, uh, Castor and Pollux. But the moon's in the way. If you look out uh, that night, uh, you might see uh, one or two bright meteors, and I've seen those in the past even with uh, the full moon in the way. Okay, at our last uh, All Space at During the Sky Report, we told you all that we were going to be watching a, a rare occurrence and a fun occurrence to watch, which is the transit of Mercury across the face of the sun. So we were closed. It was on uh, Veterans Day. We were closed. We didn't have an event, but we set up to um, record it and share it through our live stream. 
Um, and so, of course, it was a super foggy morning. Um, so here's one of our staff uh, looking rather dismayed as he looks at his computer, waiting for the fog to clear, waiting for the sun to rise. Um, so eventually, the did start to burn off um, the clouds, and then we were able to take, and uh, in this next image, a time lapse of the transit of uh, Mercury across the face of the sun. So, <laughs> yeah, oh, I guess we gave away the secret there, didn't we? So there's Mercury. You can see the clouds in and out. Then finally, it clears. <laughs> and yes, that is an airplane that it was on its way. Where was it headed again? It was Boston. headed to your to Boston. You're right. Seven fifty-seven. Could immediately look up and see what what the flight was. Thanks, if you want to see that again or any of our videos, and you've never been there, you should go to our YouTube channel for Griffith Observatory, and this is sitting right there. You can watch it again uh, and look at that little dark dot of Mercury move across the face of the sun. Uh, here is a nice slow mo of <laughs> of the plane, and we thought this was kind of cool because you can see uh, actually the exhaust coming out of the plane. Here's a photograph of it, um, and. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So it was a, what a shock. What, what's the, what are the chances an airplane's going to cross right across? But it did, and that was a fun thing to share. So uh, before we head to pretty pictures, let me just remind you all, I know I've said it, that there's no all space considered in January. Oh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you for all your sympathy. Um, and uh, this reminded us so much of one of our staff members uh, who is actually back in the booth. Sorry about this, Matthew, but this was Matthew on Halloween, and I, he looks so much like John Wick, which we haven't been able to think of him in any other way. So uh, who needs Keanu Reeves when we've got Matthew Berlando is what I've got to say about it. Yeah. Um, and uh, to that end, I also want to take a moment just to thank our amazing crew that's right here in the front uh, that are behind the scenes doing all the work producing this. And of course, our theater tech crew that's always making these events happen. So we thank you all. You don't get to see them much because we're up here and they're sitting there. But um, really, we could not put all of this together without them. So no All Space Considered in, on the first Friday of January. But on the third Friday of January, we do have a special presentation with Mike Werner, who is the principal investigator, I believe, of, uh, of the Spitzer Telescope. Um, the Spitzer Telescope is sort of Hubble's counterpart, except in the infrared, and it is shutting down. It's been operating for ooh, how many years now? Long time. Oh, uh, 20, 20, about twenty. 20 yeah. Years, yeah. And uh, <laughs> and so they are ending their mission, and um, Mike is going to join us, and he has a book, and it's going to be a wonderful evening. So there will be a little all space considered, kind of a headline news. Um, but we'll be focusing a lot on the Spitzer Space Telescope in that program. So with that, uh, let's turn down the lights. And did we determine we can show the pretty pictures? Uh, oh, sure. Oh, okay. Uh, sure. <laughs> we can leave this going and show some pretty pictures. But if we may have the lights, we're about to go into our first free picture. This is taken by our own David Pinsky of Sunset. It looks like it's taken from here at the observatory. And uh, then he uh, went up to his Mount Wilson. Yeah, it was a 60-inch night I did with LAF. And uh, I just thought I'd put the camera on a tripod and get a long exposure, low ISO, and I got a nice shot without grain. Very nice. This is a beautiful spiral galaxy with another, another neighboring galaxy next to it. Oh. Yeah, this is an owl that was rescued by the, uh, um, the fire department uh, from the Maria fire. <laughs> I know. He does not look appreciative, does he? <laughs> and this is an old little short video, but the space station had an orbit that the sun never set. The sun makes a big loop as the space station makes a complete orbit of the Earth. Wow. Kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> this is a picture of Saturn's rings and the moon Daphne, thank you, Daphnis, that is setting up waves 
that you see reflected in the ring particles. This looks to be taken by our very own Blake Estes. Yes. Through, and Sam Deary Schmidt. Yeah. Again, Griffith Observatory staff. And uh, this is a lightning fork from, uh, from, a, from a volcano in South America. Right. Nature, pretty good. This is taken by David Pinsky of our snowfall just the other day. And, and some city that I can barely figure out which one that is. Because <laughs> really, we're a mountain town. Who knew? Um, and uh, here we are uh, one month, uh, pardon me, earlier this year. Same yeah. kind of picture. But this is the one uh, for this storm. Wow. So yeah, a little bit more snow in this one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's just a lot you more. Print yeah. You yeah. yeah. I will say Calendar something. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we can pre outdate them. I will indeed print them. Yay! For 2013. Yeah, 2013 calendars. And I don't really. Yes, okay, that's what I thought. We'll go back to that. That's where we're ending. If we can bring up the lights, please. We're going to take a short break and be back for part two, a few more stories. Um, thank you for joining us for part one. We'll see you in a few minutes.
a pretty great ad they and, and mm. promotional arrangement they made with United <laughs> Airlines. Um, so Patrick, tell us a little bit more. Okay, so um, uh, so United decided to take one of the Boeing 737-800 series uh, aircraft and do this fantastic paint job on it, and actually. There's uh, two sides of the plane, as you can see, uh, the red side, of course, the dark side, with its uh, TIE fighters near the front, and uh, the blue side on the light side uh, with its uh, X-wings. And of course, uh, we saw in that video, um, the, uh, <laughs> your flight attendants will be uh, helping you, <laughs> depending on which side, the, the, uh, you know, A through C or uh, on the light side, or D through F on the other side. Um, United also, um, uh, provided some links here, and uh, you can actually track this plane if you're not lucky enough to go on board it. But, and it, it comes out to be a very interesting um, uh, symbol on the flight tra tracker. You can see that uh, when you look very carefully, that orange uh, thing is actually uh, an X-wing fighter that represents the, uh, the plane itself, and usually the icons are all these planes here, and you can't dis distinguish which is which. So this is what you get on your uh, phone app, and this is uh, what you see um, if you log into the uh, PC in that, uh, in a, in using that uh, link there. And uh, this is what I did the other day, so I, I call it in flight from um, Portland, Oregon to uh, Denver, and just expanding out, uh, this is the page that you see um, if you uh, just log in and uh, you know, find out where this uh, flight is uh, is going. It's crisscrossing all over the country. So, so uh, while that's happening, and uh, this plane is flying over the weather, uh, we have our <laughs> own weather here, and uh, we're going to start with the California drought map. Um, just kind of showing you uh, that we've had a dry season. Of course, it always is dry after um, the um, the rains that we have in uh, in uh, May, actually March and April. And uh, this is how our um, kind of uh, uh, drought situation looks. Um, it's kind of mostly abnormal dry throughout most of California, except for the uh, part in the uh, s uh, southern area. However, um, two weeks later after this happened, uh, we, we see that uh, there's been a lot of improvement in, uh, in the southernmost part of our state, and it got dry a little bit um, in the northern part. And uh, that's because of two uh, weather events that happened. One is um, kind of uh, highlighted in this uh, headline here, West Coast Bomb Cyclone. <coughs> well, what is that? Well, it, it is an intense area of low pressure, and uh, it was uh, going to bring in very <coughs> cold air across uh, Oregon and uh, also uh, most of California. So much snow that um, s s snow, so much so that uh, uh, there's predicted uh, a large snowfall over the Sierras and even over our local mountains here in Los Angeles. What does this uh, cyclone look like? Well, it's uh, you can see it up there, um, right here. It's a little, little circulation here, a deep uh, depression with a comma-shaped uh, cold front, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a, actually a video because this was taken on the uh, on the 26 by the GO-17 satellite. So uh, let's roll this video. You can see the circulation of this intense low pressure slamming right into uh, Oregon and uh, Northern California. And I just read this morning, I think, that that was the lowest pressure ever measured in California, uh, in the center yeah, of this cyclone. Yeah. In fact, the def very definition of bomb, bomb cyclone is that it is a 24 um, millibar drop of pressure um, in 24 hours. So that's equivalent to almost like uh, some, sometimes they call these uh, winter hurricanes, uh, and they're very more common in the northeast where um, uh, many feet of snow are dumped uh, by uh, deep uh, depressions like this. This is uh, the very next day where the cold air um, kind of uh, swept away um, and uh, is mostly over, northern, uh, over most of our state. And this brought down very, some very cold air on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, you can see that there was a lot of cloud cover um, over our southern part of the state. And um, so much snow that so much... So <laughs> You've got snow on the snow, I, I know. I, you know, I... I yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, You'll see the reason why. Uh, because uh, <laughs> what actually happened was that the snow levels dropped to about uh, 1,500 feet. And areas that are um, in the high desert, which are normally about 2,500 feet in altitude, got something that they've never seen in uh, over a decade. 
and oh. snow, four to five inches of snow. This is what looked like in my neighborhood out in the Antelope Valley. I woke up on Thanksgiving morning and I said, why is it so bright? <coughs> Looked out the window, I couldn't believe my eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, first time I've ever seen snow on Thanksgiving morning. And you broke out the snowshoes, right? I, 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 <laughs> I yeah, well, I had some he boots. Did, he did make a snowman, yeah. so let's Yeah, yeah, let, let's, let's, yeah, let's roll. And uh, the very next day, uh, the temperatures remain at 40 degrees, so uh, the snow remains. So here's, here's um, pictures of looking to the mountains there. Angeles uh, uh, National Forest is up there in the mountains. The whole desert was just plastered with snow. It was just unbelievable. And uh, we also have a whole collage of Im uh, images. And I think that one uh, at the top left there is from uh, Palm Springs. And uh, there's some other pictures. A board member from Friends of the Observatory took it, just snapped it out his window, out his door. Okay, so I was very excited about the snow, so I did roll a snowball on the day <laughs> of. But this is what happened four days later. It was still, you know, fairly large. And then this Wednesday, we, were, we got another uh, weather surprise. We got a lot of rain from this system that uh, basically uh, swept up south and raised the snow levels up to 7,500 feet. And um, the snowball didn't fare that well. Aww. <laughs> it got a little tinier. <laughs> looks like an icy body, actually. You know, it does. It looks a little bit like. Uh, uh, yeah, something that we're going to be talking MU about. MU69. Yeah. 2014 yeah. MU69. Yeah. Um, and then when I left work at night, this is uh, a beautiful picture of downtown, a cool, crisp night with some of uh, the clouds rolling away. Yeah, that was when I was clearing. And of course, mm -hmm. we've had just another light rain, but I believe it's all over. At late tonight, and then we have a week of sunshine. So, oh. if you guys are sick of the rain, I think it's coming to an end for for the Next for now. Weekend. Yeah, party. yeah, okay. star party exactly. for tomorrow. Yeah. So, so um, when you think methane or methane in California or Southern California, some of you might think about this. This was a big uh, methane leak at Aliso Canyon. We had it actually was the largest leak our nation has had. Um, but there are other methane sources, and uh, NASA decided to fly this aircraft over California to see what they were, to see where the methane sources actually became a nature paper, California methane super emitters. So something's going on there. Here's the map you see over on the left, and you can see some of the very dark red locations. That means a lot of methane's being emitted at that location. Now, what are these places? Well, we can see here just 10% of the point sources contributed 60% of the methane. That's pretty crazy. So very few of the sources are producing a lot of methane. Um, a third of the methane is traced to just a few super emitters. So super emitters, that seems bad. Now why do we care about this? It all has to do with the greenhouse effect, that if we didn't have the greenhouse effect on Earth, that's our atmosphere holds in some of the heat, we would be a frozen snowball if we didn't have that. And the runaway greenhouse effect, the thing we're worried about with global warming and the climate changing, is the fact that it would desiccate the earth. The earth could, the oceans could evaporate. We could become un, unhabitable. That would be bad. How's that work? Well, the sun sends energy down to the earth. It warms the earth. That warm warmth wants to re-radiate to space. Before it can get there, it runs into certain molecules, methane, carbon dioxide, water vapor. They're all greenhouse gases. They absorb some of the light, send it back in random directions. Notice some of it does get re-radiated to space, but some of it is sent back down to the Earth's surface, keeping us nice and toasty warm at you know, 59 Fahrenheit on average. That's good, but you don't want to add too much of either carbon dioxide or methane. They're both greenhouse gases. In fact, methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas. Um, it's about 70 times more powerful. You'll see this number here says 28 to 36 times. That's because they averaged over 100 years, and methane dies after about a decade. So I don't know what the EPA was thinking when they made those numbers. Um, so, but carbon dioxide takes hundreds of years to disappear from the atmosphere. That's why we're so worried about carbon dioxide going up there. Once it's there, it sticks around. Methane, not good. Yeah, it's more potent as a greenhouse gas, so we need to be concerned about it, but it does leave after just a decade. Now, what are these sources? 41% are landfills, dairies, 26%, oil and gas, 26%, and then other make up about you know, uh, water uh, purifying production and things like that give us some methane as well. So these super emitters are things like landfills and oil and gas production. 
um, and we need to worry about them. Now, what could we do? We could put collecting wells on them. You could cap them, and you could use that <coughs> methane instead of just letting it escape or burning it off. Oftentimes, you see those flames in refineries. They're burning off excess methane. Maybe we should capture it, generate heat, maybe make electricity with that heat or do other things with it. It could be nice. Now, methane is a global issue. It is, it, it, it is produced globally. It comes and goes throughout the year. This is some uh, NASA imagery. We do need to study it. We need to worry about it because it is a contributor to, to climate change and global emissions. And it's not just all cows. So we need to think about a lot of different sources. Everybody's favorite cow. And I just wanted to mention, uh, as you see the seasonal changes, just like on Mars, seasonal mm -hmm. changes. So yeah. maybe they've got cows on Mars. That's maybe. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Um, OK. So uh, moving, uh, kind of hopping around the solar system, uh, let's go back out to the Jupiter system. And this time, not about the moons, but the planet itself. Right. So uh, this planet, of course, is uh, Jupiter, the largest uh, gas giant planet in our solar system. And it has a spacecraft orbiting around it called Juno. And uh, Juno made its uh, 23rd close pass of Jupiter. And its close pass is marked by Perijove, which is uh, known as uh, PJ23, shown at the closest approach with that little arrow there. And at that point, uh, Juno is about 2,600 miles above the cloud tops of Jupiter, moving at 140,000 miles per hour. Now. Uh, during its two-hour journey from the north to the south pole of, uh, of uh, Jupiter, um, it, uh, its cam onboard cameras uh, took several pictures of its uh, clouds and cloud structures. And uh, here's one made out of six separate images, uh, all put together to give you a fisheye fish eye view. And it gives you um, an idea of uh, what kind of field of view you can see from uh, Jupiter, um, actually from Juno, if it was looking at uh, that particular region of, the, of, uh, of that planet. And now, if I may, I'm just yes. going to say a lot of times people think this, when you see them in the press a lot, you'll see, oh, here's what Juno took of Jupiter. And they show these round pictures. And it looks like that's the whole planet. But it's not. It's these fisheye images. So Patrick's going to yeah, Give so us it's going to get of scale there. right. So you you can see that storm. Uh, just uh, there's a little storm right here. I shouldn't say little because it's fairly large. It's about 1,200 miles across. We use that for scale. So uh, what we did was we wanted to know how much of the field of view uh, Juno can see in this particular picture. So what we did was we lined up uh, uh, six of those uh, uh, images across the uh, diameter of this uh, of this particular image. And it represents uh, 7,200 miles. And uh, Jupiter's diameter is 88,846 uh, miles. And that means that if you do a rough calculation, uh, it's only imaging about 8% of uh, Jupiter's uh, diameter there. So it's a really small area, but it, it means because it's, the spacecraft is very close to the, to the cloud tops, you're getting super high detailed images of the, uh, of the clouds itself. So um, we can see how detailed these are, these, th these pictures here. Um, this is a folded filamentary region, um, area of disturbance. Uh, of course, uh, these images are color exaggerated, so we can see the, some of the detail in these images. And here's another folded filament, filamented region. In the northern hemisphere of Jupiter, there's, there's a lot of this activity going on here. Uh, there's that uh, vortex or cyclone uh, that uh, we saw earlier on. And uh, notice the pattern there. It always, almost, almost looks like one of those beautiful fractal patterns, a wonderful piece of art. And we were wondering uh, what other patterns we can, uh, you know, uh, that are similar to this. Well, we decided to uh, look around, and we thought, how about this uh, red cabbage cut in half? <laughs> that, that's a nice fractal pattern that kind of resembles a vortex. Or, or this uh, beautiful flower, ranunculus. Um, all folded and uh, kind of similar. Uh, so even patterns in nature have a resemblance to, uh, to the dynamics of uh, Jupiter's uh, atmosphere. Um, another folded filamentary region, I mean, it's just absolutely breathtaking. And uh, here's one of my favorites, and color enhanced, uh, uh, showing a calm area below um, the, these uh, immense storms uh, with uh, little, you actually see these, uh, cloud features here and little shadows here. These are uh, like uh, cumulus clouds uh, made out of frozen um, ice crystals of ammonia just popping up above those immense storms. So um, 
This is not the uh, last paragraph. There's more to come, so we'll bring you more pictures uh, in the next paragraph. So uh, we will move further out in the solar system and uh, tell you just a couple of stories from <laughs> the edge of the, the solar, solar system. system. <laughs> Jeff, come on. Let's see Jeff. What are you doing over there? Can you pull that out a little so people can see it? Yeah. <laughs> right. There you go. <laughs> so, so let's try that again. You ready? Stories from the, the edge, edge of, of the solar system. So David has the first, I have the second. David, let's hear. Um, yeah, the, the New Horizons spacecraft that explored Pluto and Charon um, had an extended mission where it went into further objects in the Kuiper Belt. It was redirected to 2014 MU69, a much smaller object, to say what, a, what other stuff out there look like. Ended up looking like this, which we were pretty happily, pleasantly surprised by. It really looks like two primordial objects that squish together, or maybe it looks a little bit like <laughs> yeah. phone home, or, or we th people at the time also thought maybe it looks a little like BB-8, yeah, yeah, absolutely, or perhaps maybe, you know, yeah. yeah but this was Bill's, he was Bill's, what so. know. Um, While it, he was in jail. <laughs> I was in jail. <laughs> um, now, of course, it was named, or, or nicknamed Ultima Thule, which was sort of meant to be the, the, the furthest realm, the beyond realm, that came from mythology, they thought. Um, Norse folk have used this. Well, they didn't do a lot of investigation when they named this, unfortunately, and it turns out it has also ties to Nazism, frankly. Um, the Nazis used it as sort of a mythical place that they would go and Ultima Thule. So this, not such a great name, no. Not a good idea to name things after Nazis. I, I don't support that. However, um, this reverend here uh, was part of a renaming ceremony. Um, and it was actually um, renamed here the... Oh, Poetan. The Poetan. Yeah, the, the name used to be on there. Poetan people. And here we can hear a little bit of... This is actually an Algonquin song that he was performing um, as part of the ceremony. The name is Arako, spelled A-R-R-O-K-O-T-H. It's a Palatine Algonquin word for sky. Yeah, so Arakoth is the new name for it, which means sky, which is a much more pleasant image and, and thought for it. And if I may just add, the Powhatans are uh, in Maryland, in the Delmarva Peninsula, and into Virginia. And that is where both uh, the Applied Physics Lab and also Goddard Space Flight Center are, are all in what is was formerly Powhatan uh, territory. So that's why the selection of that as well. So the New Horizons spacecraft, of course, is sleeping right now, um, but it is still traveling through space, moving further out there. And that had Bill on our team wonder, well, what's the next object? Have they found one yet? And he fired off a, a tweet at Alan Stern. Is there any talk of another object? And he answered within one minute and said, we're planning a search. So straight from the, the, the PI, we heard it. In fact, and he was here and friend of the yeah, show. He's, he's been, been on, on our on show a couple of times, yeah. actually. Yeah. Uh, so we'll look forward to that. So uh, coming back to this, you can see there are five spacecraft that have uh, left, have traveled beyond the orbit of Pluto, which used to be the putative uh, boundary of the solar system as defined by the planets. And so um, we're going to finish uh, our little exploration of the edge of the solar system with uh, looking at not the planetary or even the gravitational edge, but the edge of the influence of the sun. And that is called the heliosphere. So wherever the sun has influence, um, we refer to that as the heliosphere. And you can see in this diagram a few features. Here are the planets in the center here. And then the sun and all of its planets are moving in that direction through the interstellar medium, the gas in between the stars. And so you get a little bit of a, a shock at the front where the, um, where the bubble of material around the solar system starts to interact and um, smash into the interstellar medium. So I'm going to use a few terms here, but you'll see why in a second. So you've got the, our, our solar system of planets. There's this termination shock, which is kind of the front you know, shock wave that hits. Then you go in through from the termination shock into a region called the heliosheath. 
and then finally hit the helio pause. So here is a little diagram. I wanted it to look the same way as the uh, NASA art, so I reversed it, but let's give you a little help there with the words so they're not, you don't have to go backward. And in fact, if you have trouble for remembering the name Heliopause, because this is a story about exploring the Heliopause, we just put some paws on there. It's a, and yes, those are the alien paws from before. Um, so, uh, so those are your, your terms. And uh, as you can see, as it moves forward e into the interstellar medium, um, there may even be a bow shock in the very front. Think of a boat plowing through the water uh, as it flows into the interstellar medium. We see this every day that you do dishes. Um, the material coming here you can see from the sink is termination shock is just where the out pushing of the water pressure kind of matches the pressure of stuff falling in. Um, and the heliosheath is where it all kind of jumbles up and mixes, and then there's the, the edge where, uh, of influence of that water stream out of, outside of which everything is dry um, that would correspond to the heliopause. Um, I mentioned the bow shock that we see on other stars. These are real pictures of other stars in the galaxy, and they all have, uh, many of them have these bow shocks. So we know this is going on. What is going on with our solar system? Well, happily, we have sent a couple of um, spacecraft to uh, out, heading out, racing out ahead of us uh, through the, uh, past the planets, and that is Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Um, just to give you a little bit of a sense, uh, here's a picture of Voyager 1, and here's a picture of Voyager 2. <laughs> so if you look, they're both NASA, but they use the same artwork, but you know, that's because they're twin missions. And they were originally, Voyager 1 went to Jupiter and Saturn, Voyager 2 went to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, what's called the Grand Tour that ended in eight, not 18, 1989, not 1899, 1989, uh, and, uh, and since then has been on this interstellar mission. So um, a couple of years ago, you might remember in the news, there was big news when Voyager 1 crossed through the solar system, or did it? It kind of did, it didn't, and uh, we talked about it here at All Space Considered. Anyway, in 2004, uh, Voyager made measurements that indicated it crossed what's called the termination shock. How many times has Voyager 1 left the solar system? <laughs> so we don't know, we can't definitively say we've left the solar system. So that has was kind of a joke because it was in, it was out, and I'm going to show you a little bit of evidence as to why that was so confusing. So now the question, of course, waiting for Voyager <laughs> 2 to cross the solar system. Um, and... Uh, Cut unit. Disclose the information. Yes, because Voyager wants to get the information about the, the termination shock. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Or are you all thinking this woman's nuts? V -ger, v -ger. Thank you, thank you. Voyager turns into V'ger. Who that's, that's that woman, Aaliyah. And do I hear anyone saying Aaliyah's theme? Oh, did you? Oh, well, you get a prize. Okay, you get a prize too. Um, so, okay, so last year we got the first indication and we got the strong indication that in fact Voyager 2 had crossed the uh, boundary of the heliopause and was passed into interstellar space. And that the way you can tell is because galactic cosmic rays, the very high energy particles that are in the interstellar medium, uh, get blocked by the heliopause, by the magnetic fields that are uh, dragged out with a solar wind and they don't, they can't come into the um, inner solar system. But once we pierce through, the number of galactic cosmic rays went up. Uh, contrast, the, all the solar electrons and the solar wind uh, dropped away. So we were no longer getting the influence of the sun and we were instead recognizing the influence of uh, galactic <coughs> cosmic rays. So the big news this month is that Nature Astronomy published five papers with all the quantitative results. And it is a very exciting um, set of results. Uh, Charts and graphs! <laughs> <laughs> so if we're going to explain it to you, we have to show you lots of charts and graphs, so we hope you're ready for that. Uh, here you go. Chart and graph number one. Um, the red is Voyager 1, the blue is Voyager 2. 
So look what happened to these cosmic rays, as I mentioned. As we were going, oh, we got a spike. Oh, it dropped back down. Oh, we got a spike. It dropped back down. And then it spiked up, and then it stayed up. That's why we kept thinking the Voyager 1 had gone out of the solar system, and then, oh, no, it's not. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, no, it's not, and so forth. That's actually a real reason. But, uh, and you can see the same thing for the uh, influence of the solar wind. It dropped, it went back up, it dropped, and then it finally dropped and went away. For Voyager 2, we saw a steadier, or a, a lower climb, but none of those spikes. And, uh, and it was a very clear and cleaner crossing of the heliopause. The other kind of cool thing about uh, that is um, that the interpretation of these spikes is that there were flux tubes that had woven through uh, the wall of the heliopause where Voyager 1 went, but not where Voyager 2 went. Remember that picture, they're in different locations, and they cross the termination shock, and they cross the heliopause uh, at different times. And so we were at different points in the solar cycle. And 2012, when it was before, was a higher, uh, more active sun, and now we're in a much less active sun. So they're really testing different places and different conditions in the heliosphere as they crossed across. Um, the other kind of cool thing, in fact, I think I wrote there, there are the flux tubes. The other kind of thing, cool thing is you get uh, the, the, in the Voyager 2 side, um, there were more leaky electrons. In other words, more electrons were escaping the heliopause and able to get out to where Voyager uh, 2 was. So they were different crossings, and they gave different insights into the nature of the heliopause. Now, uh, I am not going to take you through these because this is the ultimate charts and graphs, but as you can see, they've got measurements for all these different ions at different uh, energies. And what I can tell you is that the, the researchers who use these data do very detailed models of, of uh, what are the interactions and the energetic exchanges at that boundary. So they want all of this quantitative information to be able to test their models and refine their models. So, um, so anyway, uh, the data are there. They were all in these papers. There's kind of a nice close-up uh, showing you the count rate. Um, and uh, the other measurement was of the magnetic field. Um, this is Voyager 2's crossing. And you can see that it's very clear that after it crossed the heliopause, the magnetic field was um, stronger on the other side of the uh, heliopause than it was when it was inside the solar system. Now, um, there was another interesting aspect to that, and that is that, um, hmm, that the, uh, it, before it got there uh, from the heliosheath and went going through the heliosheath, and before it made this crossing, it rose, and there was this, what they referred to as a magnetic barrier which is not something that they saw with Voyager 1, but it was something that the models predicted. So that was kind of great, because when you have a model that predicts something and you don't see it, it can be very confusing. Also, the Voyager 1 was very confusing because it did not have uh, the particle density instrument working. Unfortunately, that instrument had failed. So it really was uncertain as to how many times it was crossing um, you know, was it in or not in the heliopause, inside the heliopause, because uh, while some of those other particle energies were changing, the magnetic field was not changing, and they expected it to, and the magnetic field direction was, um, had, didn't change at all. So one of the cool things that they discovered with Voyager 2 is the magnetic field direction didn't change here either, and they didn't expect that. So this gives us something new to model and to understand um, and put together this picture. So summarizing it all up, uh, here are the, um, the pictures, uh, the two different Voyagers, a Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. You can see they crossed uh, their termination shock and heliopause at different places and different times. Um, and the upshot of all of this is to get very quantitative information to be able to compare two models, this is just one diagram mm -hmm. of a model of the interaction of the interstellar magnetic field and interstellar plasma and the solar plasma as we pass through uh, interstellar space, as the solar bubble and all of us and all of us inside 
um, are carried through the interstellar medium. So uh, with great celebration, we have free Voyager 2. <laughs> um, it will keep going uh, unless an alien stops it or it crashes into a, a another world or a star or something like that, but it will just keep going. It has enough power to last maybe another five or six years. They've just adopted a new power saving strategy. Um, they wanted to have enough power to get them both through the heliopause and out into interstellar space. But of course, they're still taking data and sending it back. And as they get further and further from uh, the heliopause, they're sampling more and more of the more pristine interstellar medium. And so as long as we can get data, we will. But it will keep on going and with it carry this legacy of our own, uh, our own existence here in the solar system. Um, some of you asked about, uh, I think you asked about the Parker solar probe. They also came out in Nature with a series of four papers two days ago. They didn't check with us to know when all space considered was going to happen. <laughs> so in order to do a proper analysis of those papers, we're going to hold off on that. But it's a kind of a nice companion because the whole interstellar medium uh, and the boundary with the interstellar medium is influenced by the new results uh, that we're learning about how the sun functions. So okay. as you were just explaining, is it more, mostly fluid dynamics problem and not so much magnetism? Magnetic phenomena? Oh, there are absolutely. It's magnetohydrodynamics, which means it's fluid and magnetic fields all woven together and particles. So, yeah. yeah. So, so um, well, very interesting things about our sun right now. And our Earth, of course, has a nice <coughs> sun there. But, and the sun keeps us warm, like I was talking about earlier. But someday the sun is going to turn into a red giant, and it won't be such a great day for the Earth. That's. That's what this story is about. Um, now, why is that the case? Well, this is a plot, again, more charts and graphs here, of surface temperature of a star that's on the horizontal axis. On the left is very um, hot stars, on the right are cooler ones, and brightness. So one is of the brightness of the sun, 10,000 is 10,000 times brighter. Now, this is showing you how a star will evolve with time. Our sun is currently on position seven, hanging out here. Well, when it runs out of hydrogen in the core, it's actually going to get cooler on the surface, but brighter overall and head towards position nine in this diagram. So what that means is the sun's gonna swell up and get, well, it has to get bigger. I just added some radius lines on there. It's going to get about 100 times larger than it is now. So that's a bad day for Mercury, Venus, and probably Earth as well. We're gonna get swallowed up by the sun. Now, this story <laughs> is about no. this sort of thing happening. We can watch the sun getting larger. It starts to get bigger and bigger. And well, not such a good day for the Earth. About a billion years from now, the water won't be able to hang out on the surface from the Earth. About five billion years from now, this is going to happen. So it's not so good. Now, however, there is a little bit of hope. Notice, between position 9 and 10, the star cools off, or gets a little bit hotter, so it's getting hotter, and it's getting fainter. That means it gets smaller again. It's only maybe 12, 15 times the size of the, the current size of the sun. So the Earth, if it somehow could survive being in that envelope, might reemerge. This is a story where we found a planet that that might have happened to. Well, we don't know how it got there. It's in a location around its current star that it should have been swallowed up in that first red giant phase. It should have been in the envelope, yet there it is hanging out. So a very, very weird planet that was found by the TESS um, <laughs> Planet Hunting Society. Now that laugh is because the star is going to get its revenge. You notice in this diagram, the stars head back up this direction, they get cooler again, and they get larger again. So that star is going to re-engulf that planet eventually. And I like to think that, well, if somehow it can live through that phase, maybe then it'll be floating around and the planetary nebula happens. That's the outer layers of the star get blown off into space and are glow because the hot core sends out UV radiation, causing it all to glow in these beautiful colors. So, but they did find a planet that is at a location where it shouldn't be. We're on an exoplanet, I should say, because it's going around another star. So. A, a cool exoplanet, fine. So it may be completely, you know, <laughs> fried to bits, but it'll have a pretty view. It could have a pretty yeah. view, yeah. And some <laughs> folks are thinking it shouldn't be there anyway. It had to get dragged back in by tidal forces, things like that. So there's a, there's a lot of physics going on here. It perhaps wasn't in the envelope of the star. It might have been dragged in afterwards. So anyway, it, it is a neat story, and it's a, a fun planet. 
So we're going to tell a, uh, a story that we've been trying to tell for what, six months? Six months? Six months? Six Something six like months. that. And every month it gets bumped because we run out of time and Jeff graciously says, we can, we can wait and tell my story next time. Do you need a yeah, clicker? I got one. Okay. I'm playing so, the long game. So <laughs> Jeff, yeah. tell us about your visit to Virgin. Yeah. So it was a pretty brief visit uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, my dad and I actually got to visit Virgin Galactic's uh, hangar out in Mojave where they did a lot of research development testing on their uh, on their ships. This is a, uh, what, oh my goodness, I forgot the name of the ship again. No, left side. Carrier vehicle is White Knight 2. Yeah, so if we go to the next one, we can see a big, big old clear view of White Knight 2, and over there uh, is the other one. Um, <laughs> well, you can see, this is kind of a crowded hangar. This is, uh, when I went to visit, it was similarly crowded. And a big reason for this is what they were doing in here was pretty much everything. They had their R&D. They had their mission control. They had their training. Everything was going on. Uh, but a couple of months ago, they moved away from California and down into New Mexico, into a place called Spaceport America. And they moved here to this brand new shiny hangar that's got plenty of space for all of their vehicles. And the cool thing is, this place has dedicated facilities for their mission control. And not only that, but because they are intended to be a space tourism company, they have actually built uh, purpose-built places like dining rooms because their guests are going to have a three-day training period before they go up. So they've been making big steps in the last few months to getting actually functional up and running. So we expect to see lots of people uh, paying for space flight in the next few months, or next few years even. The thing is, this isn't the only thing that Virgin Galactic has been up to. Uh, they also recently uh, sort of revealed a partnership with Under Armour uh, to make some flight suits uh, that people are going to be wearing. I don't know if you can see this little Virgin Galactic thing showing the sort of evolution of flight culminating in their ship. Uh, if you've ever seen the TV show The Expanse, you may recognize that pattern from the side of the, the ship, the Razorback. So these little spacesuits here, uh, I thought were a bit reminiscent of another sci-fi, not The Expanse, but uh, Star Trek Enterprise <laughs> uniforms. Uh, this is kind of a cool thing. It's nice, it's stylish, but there's a couple of catches. They are giving away these spacesuits to free, for free to anybody who buys a flight with them. <laughs> the problem is the flight costs $250,000, um, which is pretty, you know, it's, it's less than most other people pay to go to space. Uh, the other problem is these are not spacesuits, these are flight suits. These are not going to keep you alive in vacuum. There's no oxygen hookup. They do not, they, you will die if you leave the spacecraft. Please do not do it. If you have, does anybody here have tickets? Okay, no, good. Just stay inside the ship. Fine. Another thing is a spin-off of Virgin Galactic called Virgin Orbit uh, actually repurposed an old Virgin Atlantic uh, 747 so that it can launch rockets off of it. And they're going to use it as an orbital launch system for smaller satellites. And the process of this is pretty straightforward. They're just treating the plane as if it is a flying launch pad. So they have an underslung rocket right there. Uh, the 747 is actually designed to carry a payload there to have an extra engine if they need to carry it somewhere else. Once that rocket gets going, it ditches the first stage and the second stage will kick its payload into orbit. And by having a system like this, it has a, little, a couple of minor advantages over ground-based launches. First, you don't have to maintain a launch pad and repair it after every single time it gets blasted by an enormous rocket going into space. Second, you're already above like two thirds of the Earth's atmosphere and your rocket is already moving. So Virgin Orbit is not the first company to think about this. The Pegasus launch system has 39 successful launches under its belt, and it's been a wildly successful uh, launch system. Uh, even uh, the US Air Force has been launching, uh, for example, the X-15 was an experimental uh, aircraft that this is not it. This is it. It uh, hangs on under the, uh, the bomber and just launches forward. There's been a couple of other companies that have tried. The uh, Strato launch system, for example, has been having some pretty unfortunate funding issues due to the guy who owned it dying. Um, but Virgin, or Virgin Galactic is doing a similar thing with their uh, sort of two-part vehicle, and Virgin Orbit is, is as well. 
Now, the reason I'm bringing it up here is they've been they've announced that they're going to be doing this for a few years now. But there's recently been a development in the last two months, and that is that their rocket design has updated. They've added an additional option. Instead of just having that first stage rocket that'll get you off the plane and that second stage that will get you to orbit, inside of their payload bay, in a recent presentation, they showed that inside of it, you can fit right there, a tiny little third stage rocket. And they intend to be able to use that third stage rocket to actually get out of Earth orbit around other planetary bodies. You could send a small sat to Mars, uh, cube sats to the moon. You could send them all over the place. This is actually a pretty big deal to have a private launch company that can do CubeSats to outside of Earth orbit at relatively low cost. Uh, they were inspired by uh, the uh, Mars InSight mission, which sort of had two CubeSats piggybacking off of it. And they saw that and saw a great business opportunity. So between Virgin Galactic and Virgin Orbit, we're going to see a lot of good things in the coming years for both space tourism and uh, sort of accessibility for smaller satellites in a really diverse array of places in the solar system. So uh, that's a thing that's happening. Wow. Yeah. Is a two hour flight hmm? from runway? Is it a two hour flight? I don't know the length of the flight. Uh, they int uh, for the, uh, you mean for the Virgin Orbit? The 250,000 is it for a two, <laughs> yeah. two hour yeah. flight? It's, um, I don't remember exactly the length of the flights they're offering, but it's that not a very like long thing. It sounds about right, because they're not going orbital with Virgin Galactic flights. Uh, they are going suborbital. They're crossing the threshold into space. Uh, and yes, I believe you had first. Yeah. Oh, yes. The uh, Galaxy Evolution Explorer was launched from an L-1011 by Pegasus, orbital. Yeah, yeah nice. nice. It was successful. And it, that launch <coughs> mode, it's wonderful, but there was a bit of risk to that. We were oh, very yeah. worried. Yeah. Uh, there was a, there's there a, a lot few of, of them failed. Yeah. yeah, I think they had uh, four failures out of their 39 successes. Uh, Virgin Orbit is doing a lot. Part of it is they chose the 747 because there's so much repair infrastructure for that plane. And they've already gotten manufacturing off the ground for at least the first four launches. Uh, so they're making really good progress. Uh, so we will see. Their rocket <laughs> seems sound in testing so far, but they haven't done any flight tests yet. So we'll see if it's a... Uh, if it's a good system. Lastly, yeah. quickly. The current issue of Smithsonian Air and Space mm -hmm. has an article about Virgin Orbit oh, and wonderful. Virgin Galactic. Hey. So uh, if you want to read more about it, and I believe it, I read it just a couple days ago, I believe it is about a two hour from ground to ground uh, mm -hmm. loop. That's wonderful. Cool. Five minutes and zero G. Nice. I mean, that's more than iPad. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, so, yeah, look forward to good things from the uh, private sector for uh, space industry. I have flown on the Vomit Comet, and I have, uh, I've had more time than that on zero G, and I didn't have to pay anything. So that was kind of great. Um, so, uh, of course, these private companies aren't the only ones going to space. NASA is, too. But, you know, one of the things that NASA has to offer its astronauts is a glass of wine. Um, so maybe some of you saw uh, that uh, th uh, on the cargo ship that was sent uh, this time um, by, uh, it's now Northrop Grumman, but it was actually an orbital um, uh, launcher, uh, an Artem uh, Artemis launcher, anyway, uh, was sent to the International Space Station with wine. Why wine? Because wine has active live yeast cultures inside that are fermenting and doing things that living things do. And so if you want to study uh, life in zero gravity, why not study life in a, suspended in a bottle of wine? So there are, uh, a, there was a case sent up to the space station, a case, a test or a control case sent, let me try that again. There was a case sent up to the International Space Station and a control case left here on Earth. So after a year, the wine will be brought back. The, the astronauts do not get to enjoy it. The wine is coming back to Earth so they can compare the two and see what the differences of zero gravity are. And I did like the wine spectator saying, you know, it would be interesting if what they found was that after a year in space, the bottles were empty. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not just wine. It's not just wine. Of course, astronauts do snack in space. They have that. Um, a lot of folks think they eat astronaut ice cream. We didn't have, we couldn't see that, not from what we can tell. They do get M&Ms as a snack, because they melt in your mouth, not in your hand. Um, don't make a mess. But 
Coming up might be some chocolate chip cookies for astronauts, which is a cookie for me. Yes, a cookie for you. Um, the Zero G Kitchen folks have made an oven that can, is, has been sent up to the space station. The Double Tree cookie that you can get at a Double Tree if you stay there is the dough they're using. Now they had to create that little package there because at, here on Earth you use mostly convection. The air rises, it transfers the heat in your oven, and that's why things bake. In space, that heat won't convect and different parts of the oven might stay cold. So they had to develop this special oven where it actually sandwiches the cookie and it uses um, actually conduction. So the touching of the hot things against that packet, you can see the cookie in the bottom, will cook it. So maybe one day astronauts will get cookies on their pillows where they sleep, but not this time it turns out. Cookie withdrawn. <laughs> Yeah, cookie withdrawn. Um, so, no, they don't get to eat any of these cookies. They're all coming back to Earth for study. I know. I know. I just think they get the wine and cookies, but they don't. Yeah, they don't. Five. <laughs> oh. oh, okay, I'll go back to this. Um, so, uh, that was on this launch a month ago that was a cargo ship. There was another cargo ship that just launched yesterday. And so, we're going to watch just a few seconds of that launch. Five, four, Three, this is a two, SpaceX Falcon one, 9. Zero. Engine submission. Liftoff of the Falcon 9 and Cargo Dragon, transporting critical research to enable living and working in Earth orbit and in deep space. So one asks, ooh, what critical research are they doing? And it's kind of the same. You can see the Bush Ag Agricultural Resources in the back. That is a uh, Budweiser beer experiment. And they're testing how to um, uh, turn barley and, and malt it uh, into malted barley to make beer. Now you may think wine, beer, cookies, what are these astronauts just fooling around? And the fact of the matter is that, <laughs> is that uh, there is science here because we do need to know how to cook and, and you know, uh, survive in zero gravity. But it is true that Budweiser, I mean just like um, uh, Doubletree has the kind of lock on the cookies and Budweiser, there is our partnerships with industry because we are going to need to find ways to uh, live and work in space and, and provide for the needs of those who do it. So uh, moving on from the Falcon 9, the small um, uh, rocket on the left, uh, there was another wonderful <coughs> headline from SpaceX about um, this larger rocket, the Starship. Mm -hmm. Patrick? And, and uh, yeah, what they did was they did a pressurized test of the oxidizer tank and just to see how much it would take. So let's roll the video and see what happened. <coughs> well, they, they basically uh, pressurized it to the max. <laughs> and so the, the That's top. That's a nice way to say that. To the top. Basically, the top blew off. And there it is, falling down. <laughs> but that provided a lot of. Uh, very valuable engineering data for uh, future designs of oxidizer tanks for this Starship Mark One, and that was intentional, correct? Is, uh, I heard someone that, say that. That's what that was the official uh, SpaceX line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just to they see. They wanted where to the see how much pressure at. it would yeah. take. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> All right. That's yes. exactly right. It's like if you ski, if you don't, if you're not falling, you're not getting better. Um, so, uh, you know, we're going to keep going because we're short on time, um, but at the end, if we have a little time, I'll be happy to answer. We want to do uh, two short uh, memorials. The first is to Yervant Terzian, and no one probably knows that name unless you work in the field of interstellar medium, which was my research field, and I knew him fairly well. Uh, he was a uh, professor at Caltech for 50 years, pardon me, professor at C Cornell for 50 years, and he was the chair of the department there for 20 years. Um, but he was widely known because he started and developed the New York State uh, Space Grant Consortium. NASA provided startup funds for every state in the union to create a space grant consortium, which would be industry uh, and academia uh, working together to develop um, opportunities for space education and research state by state. And he was highly active in it. He was um, the chair of the New York uh, State Space Grant Consortium for about 20 years. He chaired, was the president of the board of the uh, Alliance of Space Grant Consortia across the country uh, for many years, and he was the chair of the directors. So he was deeply involved in education. 
Um, he was also the uh, editor, uh, an associate editor of the Astrophysical Journal for 10 years. And uh, in 2018, he received the NASA Public Service Medal for all he had done to support um, and especially to encourage young people to come into astronomy. So I just want to remember Yervant, who passed away just a few days ago. Um, so our last memorial for this evening um, caused quite a lot of discussion in our group. And uh, so we had back and forth a lot of uh, different perspectives and ideas, but we liked starting with this cartoon from Calvin, Calvin and Hobbes. It says, if people sat outside and looked at the stars each night, I'll bet they'd live a lot differently. And that's not too far from what Griffith J. Griffith said that uh, started the, his notion of creating an observatory for the city of Los Angeles, which is if everyone could look through a telescope, it would change the world. The idea is that a cosmic perspective gives you a broad perspective on your own life. So uh, in that case, um, you know, we tend to think of that as being true as science, but for some people that perspective is brought by astrology. Now I want to be very clear and say that astronomy and astrology are different. I cannot tell you the number of times I've been on an airplane and said I'm an astronomer and they say, oh, I love astrology. What's your sign? <laughs> um, so they are very, very different. And we gave a lot of examples tonight of the way in which science is done by you know, modeling, proposing ideas, making predictions, taking measurements, comparing those measurements to predictions, and stay, basically playing by the rules of science within the field of science. But for a lot of other people, that's not how they appreciate the sky or the stars. And the sky is not just the province of the scientists alone. We all share the sky, and many people are influenced by, by it in different ways. Um, certainly mythology and mythological stories, if you've looked in the rotunda of our observatory here, the, these um, murals of the mythological tales behind the constellations is another way. Um, and, uh, but astrology, of course, has a tremendous following. Um, basically, the idea, of course, is that as the sun moves through the different constellations, that one can interpret meanings from it. I'm not going to try to go into any deeper exploration of that, because we really don't have the time. Um, but uh, we all also know that um, the change of Earth's orbit uh, and the precession of Earth's spin, as, uh, of the planet as it spins, has changed these, um, these constellations over time. So uh, I'm not going here to either say that astrology is, I am here to say astrology is not a science, but I am not here to say that astrology isn't some way in which people can experience and appreciate the sky. So uh, there are other, that's showing the precession of the orbit, other astrologies in many different practices. Here's a Vedic astrology. <coughs> many of us are Chinese astrology. We had a fun conversation today where, oh, I'm a dog, I'm a horse. And so whether it's for entertainment or it's for reflection or for personal insight or just fun to read the newspaper, um, millions of people in the world um, share this. So with that, we wanted to memorialize a world-famous astrologer who passed away this past <laughs> month. And Daniel, would you like to uh, tell us and uh, end the evening with a look back at Walter Mercado? Absolutely, yeah. Oh, there's a microphone it's there. That's a clicker. It's the, uh, the button on the side. Oh, ah, okay, right. Got it. I've got one. I'll go. All right. So, here we go. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, this is the, is yeah. it? oh, here it is. Okay. Everybody hear me? Oh, great. Wonderful. So today, we remember the life of a true cultural icon, Walter Mercado. How many of you knew of him or had family who knew of him prior to coming today? Okay, that's a sizable amount. Um, for a lot of people, he meant so much uh, to them. Uh, Walter was born uh, off the coast of Ponce, Puerto Rico, where he would spend most of his childhood. Yes, I said off the coast. He was actually born in a boat uh, off, uh, that was coming from Spain to Puerto Rico. Um, he attended the University of Puerto Rico, where he would study the fields of psychology, pharmacy, and pedagogy, or the study of uh, teaching. 
um, to eventually study holistic medicine. Um, Walter also had an affinity and talent for the performing arts. Uh, he would eventually study classical and even modern ballet, but he would often credit flamenco dancing as his first true love. Um, after he graduated from the university, he would go ahead and star as an actor in a few Puerto Rican telenovelas, very much in, the lo in his local Puerto Rico. However, his life would change forever when a Puerto Rican television producer pretty much invited him to host a 15 minute uh, astrology, astrology segment because the person who was supposed to do it didn't show up. And so, however, his presentation, his segment, became so popular that he became a regular um, in the Puerto Rican segment. Um, for the next several years, uh, he, would continue, he would continue to host different uh, astrology programs, um, working with TV networks with, uh, such as uh, Televisión, uh, or Telemundo and Univision, um, and produce countless astrology segments. Um, he would you know, preach uh, messages of happiness, acceptance, and of course, mucho, 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 amor, yeah. right? as he was very famously known for. Uh, at the height of his popularity, he would reach over 150 million people across the world a day, right? He reached a sizable portion of the world. And it's not hard to find anecdotes of people who said their entire families would stop whatever they're doing, completely shut up, and watch his astrology sections, right? Walter Mercado's flamboyant clothes and theatrical persona became, uh, made him an icon um, in the Latin American community for his 50-year-long uh, you know, uh, career. Um, he also became an icon in the LGBTQ community because of his proud defiance of gender norms. Uh, this past August, he actually was uh, the focus of an exhibition in the History Miami Museum in Florida where they celebrated his impact on the Latin American community. Uh, he, the exhibition displayed multiple items from his decades-long career, including these, just a few of the hundreds and hundreds of capes that he would wear on his television segments. Right. And so unfortunately, uh, he did pass away on November 2nd um, due to renal failure at the age of 87. Um, when news of his passing broke, the outpouring of love and support uh, from the Latin American community was enormous. These are just a small fraction of the messages that people put out um, celebrating the life of Walter Mercado. To many, Walter Mercado was a beacon of light and acceptance that brought the stars to them um, and to many people across the world. And so tonight, we're going to go ahead and leave you with a few words from Walter Mercado himself uh, from his 2019 uh, New Year special, the iconic words that he ended nearly every single astrology segment um, with. And so. Paz, mucha paz. Pero sobre todo, mucho, 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 mucho. Mm, amor. Thank you. So with that, we're running late. Uh, I should have gotten you out of here several minutes ago, but um, so we ask you to please li uh, leave uh, sort of directly. We <laughs> want to remind you that uh, no All Space Considered is the first Friday, but do come back on the third Friday for January. And because it's the last show of the year, we're going to play this video, but don't watch it because you have to leave. Okay. So good night, everyone. Happy holidays. Good night. Good night.